Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody come back. back. Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked Basil Netherby by A. C. Benson. It was five o'clock in the afternoon of an October day that Basil Netherby's letter arrived. I remember that my little clock had just given its warning click when the footsteps came to my door, and just as the clock began to strike, came a hesitating knock. I called out, Come in! And after some fumbling with the handle, there stepped into the room, I think, the shyest clergyman I have ever seen. He shook hands like an automaton, looking over his left shoulder. He wouldn't sit down and yet looked about the room as he stood, as if wondering why the ordinary civility of a chair was not offered him. He spoke in the husky voice, out of which he endeavoured at intervals to cast some viscous obstruction by loud hawkings, and when, after one of these interludes, he caught my eye, he went a sudden pink in the face. However, the letter got handed to me, and I gradually learned from my visitor's incoherent talk that it was from my friend Basil Netherby, and that he was well, remarkably well, quite a different man from what he had been when he came to Traheel, that he himself, Vivian was his name, was curate of St. Sibby. Traheel was the name of the house where Mr. Netherby lived. The letter had been most important, he thought, for Mr. Netherby had asked him, as he was going up to town, to convey the letter himself and to deliver it, without fail, into Mr. Ward's own hands. He could not, however, account. Here he turned away from me and hummed and beat his fingers on the table for the extraordinary condition in which he was compelled to hand it to me, as it had never, so far as he knew, left his own pocket. And presently, with a gasp, Mr. Vivian was gone, refusing all proffers of entertainment, and falling briskly down to judge from the sounds which came to me outside my door. I, Leonard Ward, was then living in rooms in a little street out of Holborn, a poor place enough. I was an organist of St. Bartholomew's Holborn, and I was trying to do what is described as getting up a connection in the teaching line. But it was slow work, and I must confess that my prospects did not appear to me very cheerful. However, I taught one of the vicar's little daughters, and a whole family, the children of a rich tradesman in a neighbouring street, the piano and singing, so that I contrived to struggle on. Basil Netherby had been with me at the College of Music. His line was composing. He was a pleasant, retiring fellow, voluble enough, and even rhetorical in tete-a-tete -tete talk with an intimate, but dumb in company, with an odd streak of something, genius or eccentricity, about him which made him different from other men. We had drifted into an intimacy, and had indeed lodged together for some months. Netherby used to show me his works, mostly short studies. And though I used to think that they were always rather oddly broke down in unexpected places, yet there was always an air of aiming high about them, an attempt to realise the ideal. He left the college before I did, saying that he had learnt all he could learn, and that now he must go quietly into the country somewhere and work alone. He should do no good otherwise. I heard from him fitfully. He was in Wales, in Devonshire, in Cornwall and then, some three months before the day on which I got the letter, the correspondence had ceased altogether. I didn't know his address, and was always expecting to hear from him. I took up the letter from the place where Mr. Vivian had laid it down. It was a bulky envelope, and it was certainly true that, as Mr. Vivian had said, the packet was in an extraordinary condition. One of the corners was torn off, with a ragged edge that looked like the nibbling of mice, and there were disagreeable stains both on the front and the back, so that I should have inferred that Mr. Vivian's pocket had been filled with raspberries. The theory, though improbable, did not appear impossible. But what surprised me most was that near each of the corners in front a rough cross of ink was drawn, and one at the back of the flap. I had little doubt, however, that Mr. Vivian had, in a nervous and absent mood, harried the poor letter into the condition in which I saw it, and that he had been unable to bring himself to confess to the maltreatment. I tore the letter open. There fell out several pages of manuscript music, and a letter in which Basil, dating from Traheel, and writing in a bold, firm hand, bolder and firmer, I thought, than of old, said 
that he had been making a good deal of progress and working very hard, which must account for his silence, and he ventured to enclose some of his last work, which he hoped I would like. But he wanted a candid opinion. He added that he had got quarters at a delightful farmhouse not far from Graham Pound. That was all. Stay, that was not all. The letter finished on the third side, but as I closed it, I saw written on the fourth page, very small, in a weak, loose hand, and as if scribbled in a ferocious haste as a man might write, so it came oddly into my head, who was escaped for a moment from the vigilance of a careful jailer. A single sentence. Vivian will take this. And for God's sake, dear Leonard, if you would help a friend who is on the edge, I dare not say of what, come to me tomorrow, uninvited. You will think this very strange, but do not mind that, only come unannounced. Do you see? The line broke off in an unintelligible flourish. Then, on each corner of the last page, had been scrawled a cross with the same ugly and slovenly haste as the crosses on the envelope. My first thought was that Basil was mad. My next thought, that he had drifted into some awkward situation, fallen under some unfortunate influence, was perhaps being blackmailed. And I knew his sensitive character well enough to feel sure that whatever the trouble was, it would be exaggerated ten times over by his lively and apprehensive mind. Slowly, a situation shaped itself. Basil was a man, as I knew, of an extraordinary austere standard of morals, singularly guileless and innocent of worldly matters. Someone, I augured, some unscrupulous woman, had, in the remote spot where he was living, taken a guileful fancy to my poor friend, and had doubtless, after veiled overtures, resolved on a bolder policy, and was playing on his sensitive and timid nature by some threat of nameless discourse, some vile and harrowing innuendo. I read the letter again, and still more clear did it seem to me that he was in some strange durance and suffering under abominable fears. I rose from my chair and went to find a timetable that I might see when I could get to Grand Pound, when again a shuffling footstep drew to my door, an uncertain hand knocked at the panel, and Mr. Vivian again entered the room. This time his confusion was even greater, if that were possible, than it had been previously. He had forgotten to give me a further message, and he thereupon gave me a filthy scrap of paper, nibbled and stained like the envelope, apologized with unnecessary vehemence, uttered a strangled cough, and stumbled from the room. It was difficult enough to decipher the paper, but I saw that a musical phrase had been written on it, and then, in a moment, I saw that it was a phrase from an old, extravagant work of Basil's own, a credo, which we had often discussed together, the grim and fantastic accompaniment of the sentence, He descended into hell. This came to me as a message of even greater urgency, and I hesitated no longer. I sat down to write a note to the father of my family of pupils, in which I said that important business called me away for two or three days. I looked out a train, and found that by catching the ten o'clock limited mail, I could be at Grandpa by six in the morning. I ordered a hasty dinner, and I packed a few things into a bag with the oppressive sense of haste but as generally happens on such occasions, I found that I still had two or three hours in hand. So I took up Netherby's music and read it through carefully. Certainly he had improved wonderfully in handling, but what music it was! It was like nothing of which I had ever even dreamed. There was a wild, intemperate voluptuousness about it, a kind of evil relish of beauty which gave me a painful thrill. To make sure that I wasn't mistaken, Owing to the nervous tension which the strange event had produced in me, I put the things in my pocket and went out to the house of a friend, Dr. Grierson, an accomplished and critical musician who lived not far away. I found the great man at home smoking leisurely. He had a bird-like demeanour, like an ancient stork, as he sat blinking through spectacles astride of a long-pointed nose. He had a slight acquaintance with Netherby, 
and when I mentioned that I had received some new music from him, which I wished to submit to him, he showed obvious interest. A promising fellow, he said, only, of course, too uh, transcendental. He took the music in his hand, he settled his spectacles, and read. Presently he looked up, and I saw in the kind of shamefaced glance with which he regarded me that he had found something of the same incomprehensible sensuality which had so oddly affected myself in the music. Come, come, he said rather severely, this is very strange stuff. This won't do at all, you know. But we must just hear this. He rose and went to his piano, and peering into the music, he played the pieces deliberately and critically. Heard upon the piano, the accent of subtle evil that ran through the music became even more obvious. I seemed to struggle between two feelings, an overpowering admiration and a sense of shame at my own capacity for admiring it. But the great man was still more moved. He broke off in the middle of a bar and tossed the music to me. This is filthy stuff, he said. I shall say to you, burn it. It's clever, of course, hideously, devilishly clever. Look at the progression, F sharp against F natural, you observe. And then he added some technical details with which I need not trouble my readers. He went on. But the man has no business to think of such things. I don't like it. Tell him from me that it won't do. There must be some reticence in art, you know, and there is none here. Tell Netherby that he is on the wrong tack altogether. Good heavens, he added, how could the man write it? He used to be a decent sort of fellow. It may seem extravagant to write thus of music, but I can only say that it affected me as nothing I had ever heard before. I put it away, and we tried to talk of other things, but we couldn't get the stuff out of our heads. Presently I rose to go, and the doctor reiterated his warnings still more emphatically. The man is a criminal in art, he said, and there must be an end once and for all for this. Tell him it's abominable. I went back, caught my train, and was whirled sleepless and excited to the west. Towards morning I fell into a troubled sleep, in which I saw in tangled dreams the figure of a man running restlessly among stony hills. Over and over again the dream came to me, and it was with a grateful heart, though very weary, that I saw a pale light of dawn in the east, and the dark trees and copses along the line becoming more and more defined by swift gradations in the chilly autumn air. It was very still and peaceful when we drew up at Brambound Station, I inquired my way to Traheel, and I was told it was three or four miles away. The porter looked rather inquiringly at me. There was no chance of obtaining a vehicle, so I resolved to walk, hoping that I should be freshened by the morning air. Presently a lane struck off from the main road which led up a wooded valley with a swift stream rushing along. In one or two places the chimney of a deserted mine with desolate rubbish heaps stood beside the road. At one place, a square church tower with pinnacles looked solemnly over the wood. The road rose gradually. At last, I came to a little hamlet, perched high up on the side of the valley. The scene was incomparably beautiful. The leaves were yellowing fast, and I could see a succession of wooded ridges with a long line of moorland closing the view. The little place was just waking into quiet activity. I found the bustling man taking down shutters from a general shop, which was also the post office, and inquired where Mr. Netherby lived. The man told me that he was in lodgings at Traheel, the big house itself, where a farmer Hall lives now. If you go straight along the road, he added, you will pass the lodge, and Traheel lies up in the wood. I was by this time very tired. It was now nearly seven, but I took up my bag again and walked along a road passing between high hedges. Presently the wood closed in again, and I saw a small plastered lodge with a thatched roof standing on the left among some firs. The gate stood wide open, and the road which led into the wood was grass-grown, though with deep ruts along which heavy-laden carts seemed to have passed recently. The lodge seemed deserted, and I accordingly struck off into the wood. 
Presently the undergrowth grew thicker, and huge sprawling laurels rose in all directions. Then the track took a sudden turn, and I saw straight in front of me the front of a large Georgian house of brown stone, with a gravel sweep up to the door, but all overgrown with grass. I confess that the house displeased me strangely. It was substantial, homely, and large, but the wood came up close to it on all sides, and it seemed to stare at me with its shuttered windows, with a look of dumb resentment, like a great creature at bay. I walked on, and saw that the smoke went up from a chimney to the left. The house, as I came closer, presented a front with a stone portico, crowned with a pediment. To the left and right were two wings, which were built out in advance from the main part of the house, throwing the door back into shadow. I pulled a large handle which hung beside the door, and a dismal bell rang somewhere in the house, rang on and on as if unable to cease. Then footsteps came along the floor within, and the door was slowly and reluctantly unbarred. There stood before me a little pale woman with a timid, downcast air. "'Does Mr. Netherby live here?' I said. "'Yes, he lodges here, sir. Uh, "'Can I see him?' I said. "'Well, sir, he's not up yet. Uh, "'Does he expect you?' "'Well, uh, not exactly,' I said, faltering. "'But he will know my name, "'and I have come a long way to see him.' The woman raised her eyes and looked at me, and I was aware by some swift intuition that I was in the presence of a distressed spirit labouring under some melancholy prepossession. "'Will you be here long?' she asked suddenly. "'No,' I said. "'But I shall have to stay the night, I think. I travelled all last night, and I am very tired. In fact, I shall ask to sit down and wait till I can see Mr. Netherby.' She seemed to consider for a moment, and then led me into the house. We entered a fine hall with stone flags and pillars on each side. There hung, so far as I could see in the half-light, grim and faded portraits on the walls. And there were some indistinct pieces of furniture, like couched beasts in the corners. We went through a door and down a passage, and turned into a large, rather bare room, which showed, however, some signs of human habitation. There was a table, laid for a meal. An old piano stood in a corner, and there were a few books lying about. On the walls hung large pictures in tarnished frames. I put down my bag and sat down by the fire in an old armchair, and almost instantly fell into a drowse. I have an indistinct idea of the woman returning to ask if I would like some breakfast, or wait for Mr. Netherby. I said hastily that I would wait, being in the oppressed condition of drowsiness when one's only idea is to get a respite from the presence of any person, and fell again into a heavy sleep. I woke suddenly with a start, conscious of a movement in the room. Basil Netherby was standing close beside me, with his back to the fire, looking down at me with a look which I can only say seemed to me to betoken a deep annoyance of spirit. But seeing me awake, there came onto his face a smile of a reluctant and diplomatic kind. I started to my feet, giddy and bewildered, and shook hands. "'My word,' he said. "'You sleep sound, Ward. So you've found me out. Well, I'm very glad to see you, but what made you think of coming? And why didn't you let me know? I would have sent someone to meet you.' I was a good deal nettled at this ungenial address, after the trouble to which I had put myself. I said, "'Well, really, Basil, I think it's rather strong. Mr. Vivian called me yesterday with a letter from you.' And some music, and of course I came away at once. Uh, of course, he said, looking on the ground, and then added rather hastily, Now, how did the stuff strike you? I have improved, I think, and it's really very good of you to come off at once to criticise the music. Very good of you, he said with some emphasis, and man, you look wretchedly tired. Let us have breakfast. I was just about to remonstrate and to speak about the postscript when he looked at me suddenly with so peculiar and disagreeable a glance that the words literally stuck in my throat. I thought to myself that perhaps the subject was too painful to enter upon at once, and that he probably wished to tell me at his own time what was in the background. 
we breakfasted, and now that I had leisure to look at Basil, I was surprised beyond measure at the change in him. I had last seen him a pale, rather haggard youth, loose-limbed and untidy. I saw before me a strongly built and firmly knit man, with a ruddy colour and bronzed cheek. He looked the embodiment of health and well-being. His talk, too, after the first impression of surprise wore off, was extraordinarily cheerful and amusing. Again and again he broke out into loud laughter, not the laughter of an excited or hectic person, but the firm, brisk laugh of a man full to the brim of good spirits and health. He talked of his work, of the country people that surrounded him, whose peculiarities he seemed to observe with much relish. He asked me, but without any appearance of interest, what I thought about his work. I tried to tell him what Dr. Grierson had said, and what I had felt, but I was conscious of being at a strange disadvantage before this genial personality. He laughed loudly at our criticisms. Oh, Grierson, he said, why, he's no better than a clergyman's widow. He would stop his ears if you read Shakespeare to him. My dear man, I have travelled a long way since I saw you last. I have found my tongue. And what is more, I can say what I mean, and I mean it. Christen indeed. I can see him looking shocked like a pelican with a stomachache. This was a felicitous thought, though not a courteous description of our old friend. But I could find no words to combat it. Indeed, Basil's talk and whole bearing seemed to carry me away like a swift stream, and in my weary condition I found that I could not stand up to his radiant personality. After breakfast he advised me to have a good sleep, and he took me, with some show of solicitude, to a little bedroom which had been got ready for me. He unpacked my things and told me to undress and go to bed, that he had some work to do that he was anxious to finish, and that after luncheon we would have a stroll together. I was too tired to resist, and fell at once into a deep sleep. I rose a new man, and finding no one in Basil's room, I strolled out for a moment onto the drive, and presently saw the odd and timid figure of Mrs. Hall coming along, in a big white flapping sort of sunbonnet, with a basket in her hand. She came straight up to me in a curious, resolute sort of way, and it came into my mind that she had come out for the very purpose of meeting me. I praised the beauty of the place, and said that I supposed she knew it well. Yes, she said, adding that she was born in the village, and her mother had been as a girl a servant at Treheel. But she went on to tell me that she and her husband had lived till recently at a farm down in the valley, and had only been a year or so in the house itself. Old Mr. Heel, the last owner, had died three or four years before, and it had proved impossible to let the house. It seemed that when the trustees gave up all idea of being able to get a tenant, they had offered it to the halls at a nominal rent to act as caretakers. She spoke in a cheerless way, with her eyes cast down, and with the same strained look as of one carrying a heavy burden. "'You will have heard of Mr. Heel, perhaps,' she said, with a sudden look at me. "'The old squire, sir,' she said, "'but I think people here are unfair to him. He lived a wild life enough, but he was a kind gentleman in his way, and I have often thought it was not his fault altogether. He married soon after he came into the estate, a Miss Tregaskis from down at St. Urn, and they were a very happy couple for a little, but she died after they'd been married a couple of years, and they had no child. And then I think Mr. Heel shut himself up a good deal amongst his books. He was a very clever gentleman, and then he got into bad ways. But it was the sorrow in his heart that made him bad. And we must not blame people too much, must we? She looked at me with a rather pitiful look. You mean, I said, that he tried to forget his grief and did not choose the best way to do it? Yes, sir, said Mrs. Hall simply. I think he blamed God for taking away what he loved instead of trusting him. And no good comes of that. The people here got to hate him. He used to spoil the young people, sir, you know what I mean, and they were afraid of seeing him about their houses. I remember, sir, as if it were yesterday, seeing him in the lane to St. Sibby. He was marching along very upright, with his white hair, went white early, and he passed old Mr. Miles, the churchwarden, who had been a wild young man, too, but he found religion with the Wesleyans, 
and after that, was hard on everyone. It was the first time they had met since Mr. Miles had become serious, and Mr. Heels stopped in his pleasant way and held out his hand to Mr. Miles, who put his hands behind him and said something. I was close to them, which I couldn't quite catch, but it was about fellowship with the worlds of darkness. And then Mr. Miles turned and went on his way, and Mr. Heel stood looking after him with a curious smile on his face, and I have pitied him ever since. Then he turned and saw me. He always took notice of me. I was a girl then, and he said to me, There, Mary, you, you see that? I am not good enough, it seems, for Mr. Miles. Well, I don't blame him. But remember, child, that the religion which makes a man turn his back on an old friend is not a good religion. But I could see he was distressed, though he spoke quietly. And as I went on, he gave a sigh, which somehow stays in my mind. Perhaps, sir, you would like to look at his picture. It was painted at the same time as Mrs. Heel in the first year of their marriage. I said I should like to see it, and we turned to the house. She led me to a little room that seemed like a study. There was a big bookcase full of books, mostly of a scientific kind, and there was a large knee-hole table, much dotted with ink spots. It was here, she said, he used to work hour after hour. On the wall hung a pair of pictures, one that of a young woman, hardly more than a girl, with a delightful expression, both beautiful and good. She was dressed in some white material, and there was a glimpse of sunlit fields beyond. Then I turned to the portrait of Mr. Heel, it represented a young man in a claret-coloured coat, very slim and upright. It showed a face of great power, a big forehead, clear-cut features and a determined chin with extraordinarily bright large eyes. Evidently the portrait of a man of great physical and mental force who would do whatever he took in his hand with all his might. It was very finely painted, with a dark background of woods against a stormy sky. I was immensely struck by the picture, and not less by the fact that there was an extraordinary, though indefinable, likeness to Mrs. Hall herself. I felt somehow that she perceived that I had noticed this, for she made as though to leave the room. I couldn't help the inference that I was compelled to draw. I lingered for a moment, looking at the portrait, which was so lifelike as to give an almost painful sense of the presence of a third person in the room. Mrs. Hall went out, and I understood that I was meant to follow her. She led the way into their own sitting-room, and then, with some agitation, she turned on me. "'I understand that you're an old friend of Mr. Netherby, sir,' she said. "'Yes,' I said. "'He is my greatest friend. "'Could you persuade him, sir, to leave this place?' she went on. "'You'll think it a strange thing to say, and I'm glad enough to have a lodger, and I like Mr. Netherby, but—' Do you think it is a good thing for a young gentleman to live so much alone? I saw that nothing was to be gained by reticence, so I said, Now, Mrs. Hall, I think we had better speak plainly. I am, I confess, anxious about Mr. Netherby. I don't mean that he is not well, for I have never seen him look better, but I think that there's something going on which I don't wholly understand. She looked at me suddenly with a quick look, and then, as if deciding that I was to be trusted, she said in a low voice, Yes, sir. That is it. This house is not like other houses. Mr. Heel, how shall I say it, was a very determined gentleman, and he used to say that he would never leave the house, and you'll think it very strange that I should speak thus to a stranger. I don't think he has left it. We stood there for a moment silent, and I knew that she had spoken the truth. While we thus stood, I can only say what I felt. I became aware that we were not alone. The sun was bright in the woods outside, the clock ticked peacefully in a corner, but there was something unseen all about us which lay very heavily on my mind. Mrs. Hall put out her hands in a deprecating way and then said in a low and hurried voice, He would do no harm to me, sir. We are too near for that. She looked up at me and I nodded. But I can't help it, can I, if he is different with other people. Now, Mr. Hall is not like that, sir. He's a plain good man and would think what I'm saying no better than madness. But as sure as there is a God in heaven, Mr. Heel is here. And though he is too 
fine a gentleman to take advantage of my talk, yet he liked to command other people, and went his own way too much. While she spoke, the sense of oppression, which I had felt a moment before, drew off all of a sudden, and it seemed again as though we were alone. Mrs. Hall, I said, you're a good woman. These things are very dark to me, and though I've heard of such things in stories, I never expected to meet them in the world. But I will try what I can do to get my friend away, though he is a willful fellow, and I think he will go his own way too. While I spoke, I heard Basil's voice outside calling me, and I took Mrs. Hall's hand in my own. She pressed it and gave me a very kind, sad look, and so I went out. We lunched together, Basil and I, off simple fare. He pointed with an air of satisfaction to the score which he had brought into the room, written out with wonderful precision. Just finished, he said, and you shall hear it later on. But now we will go and look around the place. Was there ever such luck as to get a harbourage like this? I've been here two months and feel like staying forever. The place is in Chancery, Old Heel of Traheel, the last of the stock, a rare old blackguard, died here. They tried to let the house and failed and put Farmer Hall in at last. The whole place belongs to a girl ten years old. It's a fine house. We'll look at that tomorrow, but today we will walk round outside. By the way, how long can you stay? Uh, I must get back on Friday at latest, I said. I have a choir practice and a lesson on Saturday. Basil looked at me with a good-natured smile. Pretty poor business, isn't it, he said. I would rather pick oakum myself. Here I live in a fine house for next to nothing, and right, right, right. There's a life for a man. Don't you find it lonely, said I. Lonely, said Basil, laughing loud. Not a bit of it. What do I want with a pack of twaddlers all about me? I tread a path among the stars, and... I have the best of company, too. He stopped and broke off suddenly. I should have thought Mrs. Hall very enlivening company, I said. By the way, what an odd-looking woman. She seems as if she were frightened. At that innocent remark, Basil looked at me suddenly with the same expression of indefinable anger that I had seen in his face at our first meeting. But he said nothing for a moment. Then he resumed. No, I want no company but myself and my thoughts. I tell you, Ward... If you had done as I have done, opened a door into the very treasure house of music, and had only just to step in and carry away as much as one can manage at a time, you wouldn't want company. I could make no reply to this strange talk, and he presently took me out. I was astonished at the beauty of the place. The ground fell sharply at the back, and there was a terrace with a view over a little valley with pasture fields at the bottom, crowned with low woods beyond a wide prospect over uplands which lost themselves in the haze. The day was still and clear, and we could hear the running of the stream below, the cooing of doves and the tinkling of a sheep bell. To the left of the house lay large stables and barns, which were in the possession of the farmer. We wandered up and down by paths and lanes, sometimes through the yellowing woods, sometimes on open ground, the most perfect views bursting upon us on every side. Everything lying in a rich, still peace, which came upon my tired and bewildered mind, like soft music. In the course of our walk, we suddenly came upon a churchyard, surrounded by a low wall. At the farther end, beyond the graves, stood a small church, consisting of two aisles, with a high perpendicular tower. St. Sibby, said Basil, whether he or she, I know not, but no doubt a very estimable person. Would you like to look at this? The church is generally open. We went up a gravel path and entered the porch. The door was open, and there was an odd, close smell in the building. It was a very plain place, with the remains of a rude loft and some ancient woodwork, but the walls were mildewed and green, and the place looked neglected. Vivian is a good fellow, said Basil, looking round, but he's single-handed here. The rector is an invalid and lives in Penzance, and Vivian has a wretched stipend. Look here, Leonard, here is the old heel vault. He led me into a little chapel near the tower which opened onto the church by a single arch. The place was very dark, but I could see a monument or two of an ancient type with some brasses. There were a couple of helmets on iron supports and the remains of a mouldering banner, but just opposite to us was a tall, modern, marble monument on the wall. 
That's old Heel's monument, said Basil, with a long, pious inscription by the old rector. Just look at it. Did you ever see such vandalism? I drew near. Then I saw that the monument had been defaced in a hideous and horrible way. There were deep dints in the marble like the marks of a hammer, and there were red stains over the inscription, which reminded me in a dreadful way of the stains on the letter given to me by Vivian. Good heavens, I said, what inconceivable brutality! Who on earth did this? That's just what no one can find out, said Basil, smiling. But the inscription was rather too much, I confess. Look at this. Who discharged in an exemplary way the duties of a landowner and a Christian. Old Heel's ideas of the duties of a landowner was to screw as much as he could out of his farmers, and he had, moreover, some old ideas, which we may call feudal, about his relations with the more attractive of his tenants. He was a cheerful old boy, and as to the Christian part of it, well, he had about as much of that, I gather, as you may take up on a two-pronged fork. Still, they might have left the old man alone. I dare say he sleeps sound enough in spite of it all. He stamped his foot on the pavement as he did so, which returned a hollow sound. Are you inside? said Basil laughingly. Perhaps not at home. Don't talk like that, I said to Basil, whose levity seemed to me disgusting. Certainly not, my boy, he said, if you don't like it. I dare say the old man can look after himself. And so we left the church. We returned home about four o'clock. Basil left me on the terrace and went into the house to interview Mrs. Hall on the subject of dinner. I hung for a time over the balustrade, but getting chilly and still not feeling inclined to go in, I strolled to the farther end of the terrace, which ran up to the wood. On reaching the end, I found a stone seat, and behind it, between two yews, a little dark, sinister path that led into the copse. I do not know exactly what feeling it was which drew me to enter upon the exploration of the place. The path was slippery and overgrown with moss, and the air of the shrubbery into which it led was close and moist, full of the breath of rotting leaves. The path ran with snake-like windings, so that at no point was it possible to see more than a few feet ahead. Above, the close boughs held hands as if to screen the path from the light. Then. The path suddenly took a turn to the left and went straight to the house. Two yews flanked the way, and a small flight of granite steps, slimy and mildewed, led up to a little door in the corner of the house, a door which had been painted brown like the colour of the stone, and which was let into its frame so as to be flush with the wall. The upper part of it was pierced with a couple of apertures like eyes, filled with glass, to give light to the passage within. The steps had evidently not been trodden for many months, even years, but upon the door near the keyhole were odd marks, looking as if scratched by the hoofs of some beast. A goat, I thought, as if the door had been impatiently struck by something awaiting entrance there. I do not know what was the obsession which fell on me at the sight of this place. A cold dismay seemed to spring from the dark and clutch me. There are places which seemed so soaked, as it were, in malign memories that they give out a kind of spiritual aroma of evil. I have seen in my life things which might naturally seem to produce in the mind associations of terror and gloom. I have seen men die. I have seen a man writhe in pain on the ground from a mortal injury. But I never experienced anything like the thrill of horror which passed through my shuddering mind at the sight of the little door with its dark eye-holes. I went in chilly haste down the path and came out upon the terrace, looking out over the peaceful woods. The sun was now setting in the west among cloud fjords and bays of rosy light, but the thought of the dark path lying like a snake among the thickets dwelt in my mind and poisoned all my senses. Presently I heard the voice of Basil call me cheerfully from the corner of the house. We went in. A simple meal was spread for us, half tea, half dinner, to which we did the full justice. But afterwards, though Basil was fuller than ever, so it seemed to me, of talk and laughter, I was seized with so extreme a fatigue that I drowsed off several times in the course of our talk, till at last, laughingly, he ordered me to bed. I slept profoundly. When I awoke, it was a bright day. 
My curtains had been drawn, and the materials from my toilet arranged where I slept. I dressed hastily and hurried down to find Basil awaiting me. That morning we gave up to exploring the house. It was a fine old place, full from end to end of the evidences of long and ancestral habitation. The place was full of portraits. It was a great old dining room. Basil had had the whole house unshuttered for my inspection. A couple of large drawing rooms, long passages, bedrooms, all full of ancient furniture and pictures, as if the family life had been suddenly suspended. I noticed that he did not take me to the study, but led me upstairs. This is my room, said Basil suddenly, and we turned into a big room in the left-hand corner of the garden front. There was a big four-post bedroom here, a large table in the window, a sofa, and some fine chairs. But what at once attracted my observation was a low door in the corner of the room, half hidden by a screen. It seemed to me, as if by a sudden gleam of perception, that this door must communicate with the door I had seen below, and presently, while I stood looking out at the great window upon the valley, I said to Basil, And uh, that door in the corner? Does that communicate with the little door in the wood? When I said this, Basil was standing by the table, bending over some manuscripts. He suddenly turned to me, and gave me a very long, penetrating look, and then, as if suddenly recollecting himself, said, My dear Ward, you are a very observant fellow. Yes, there is a little staircase there that goes down into the shrubbery and leads to the terrace. You remember that old heel of whom I told you? Well, he had this room, and he had visitors at times whom I dare say it was not convenient to admit to the house. They came and went this way, and he too, no doubt, used the stairs to leave the house and return unseen. How curious, I said. I confess, I should not care to have this room. I didn't like the look of the shrubbery door. Well, said Basil, I do not feel with you. To me, it's rather agreeable to have the association of the room. He was a loose old fish, no doubt, but he lived his life, and I expect he enjoyed it, and that is more than most of us can claim. As he said the words, he crossed the room, and opening the little door, he said, Come and look down. It's a simple place enough. I went across the room, and looking in, saw a small flight of stairs going down into the dark, at the end of which the two square panes of the little shrubbery door were outlined in the shadow. I cannot account for what happened next. There was a sound in the passage, and something seemed to rush up the stairs and passed me. A strange, dull smell came from the passage. I know that there fell on me a sort of giddiness and horror, and I went back into the room with hands outstretched like Elmius the sorcerer, seeking someone to guide me. Looking up, I saw Basil regarding me with a baleful look and a strange smile on his face. What was that? I said. Surely something came up there. I I don't know what it was. There was a silence then. My dear Ward, said Basil, you are behaving very oddly. I wanted to think he had seen a ghost. He looked at me with a sort of gleeful triumph, like a man showing the advantages of a house or the beauties of a view to an astonished friend. But again I could find no words to express my sense of what I had experienced. Basil went swiftly to the door and shut it, and then said to me with a certain sternness, Come, we have been here long enough. Let us go on. I'm afraid I'm boring you. We went downstairs, and the rest of the morning passed, so far as I can remember, in a species of fitful talk. I was endeavouring to recover from the events of the morning, and Basil, well, he seemed to me like a man who was fencing with some difficult question. Though his talk seemed spontaneous, I felt somehow that it was that of a weak antagonist endeavouring to parry the strokes of a persistent assailant. After luncheon, Basil proposed a walk again. We went out on a long ramble, as we had done the previous day, but I remember little of what happened. He directed me upon a stream of indifferent talk, but I laboured, I think, under a heavy depression of spirit, and my conversation was held up merely as it might have been as a shield against the insistent demands of my companion. Anyone who has been through a similar experience in which he wrestles with some tragic fact and endeavours merely to meet and answer the sprightly suggestions of some cheerful companion can imagine what I felt. At last, the evening began to close in. We retraced our steps. 
Basil told me that we should dine at an early hour, and I was left alone in my room. I became the prey of the most distressing and poignant reflections. What I had experienced convinced me that there was something about the whole place that was uncanny and abnormal. The attitude of my companion, his very geniality, seemed to me to be forced and unnatural, and my only idea was to gain, if I could, some notion of how I should proceed. I felt that questions were useless, and I committed myself into the hands of Providence. I felt that here was a situation that I could not deal with, and that I must leave it in stronger hands than my own. This reflection brought me some transitory comfort, and when I heard Basil's voice calling me to dinner, I felt that sooner or later the conflict would have to be fought out, and that I could not myself precipitate matters. After dinner, Basil, for the first time, showed some signs of fatigue, and after a little conversation he sank back in a chair, lit a cigar, and presently asked me to play something. I went to the piano, still, I must confess, seeking for some possible opportunity of speech, and let my fingers stray as they moved along the keys. For a time I extemporized and then fell into some familiar music, I do not know whether the instinctive thought of what he had scrawled upon his note to me influenced me, but I began to play Mendelssohn's anthem, Hear My Prayer. While I played the initial phrase, I became aware that some change was making itself felt in my companion, and I had hardly come to the end of the second phrase when a sound from Basil made me turn round. I do not think that I ever received so painful a shock in my life as that which I experienced at the sight that met my eyes. Basil was still in the chair where he had seated himself, but instead of the robust personality which he had presented to me during our early interviews, I saw in a sudden flash the Basil that I knew, only infinitely more tired and haggard than I had known him in life. It was like a man who had cast aside a mask, and had suddenly appeared in his own part. He sat before me, as I had often seen him sit, leaning forward in an intensity of emotion. I stopped suddenly, wheeled round in my chair, and said, Basil, tell me what has happened. He looked at me, cast an agitated glance around the room, and then all of a sudden began to speak in a voice that was familiar to me of old. What he said is hardly for me to recount but he led me step by step through a story so dark in horrors that I can hardly bring myself to reproduce it here. Imagine an untainted spirit entering cheerfully upon some simple entourage, finding himself, little by little, within the net of some overpowering influence of evil. He told me that he had settled at Traheel in his normal frame of mind, that he had intended to tell me of his whereabouts, but that there had gradually stolen into his mind a sort of unholy influence. At first, he said, I, I resisted it, but it was accompanied by so extraordinary an access of mental power and vigour that he had accepted the conditions under which he found himself. I had better, perhaps, try to recount his own experience. He had come to Grand Pound in the course of his wanderings, and had inquired about lodgings. He had been referred to the farmer at Traheel. He had settled himself there, only congratulating himself upon the mixture of quiet and dignity which surrounded him. He had arranged his life for tranquil study, had chosen his rooms, and had made the best disposition he could of his affairs. The second night, he said, that I was here. I had gone to bed thinking of nothing but my music. I had extinguished my light and was lying quietly in bed watching the expiring glimmer of the embers on my hearth. I was wondering, as one does, weaving all kinds of fancies about the house and the room in which I found myself, lying with my head on my hand, when I saw, to my intense astonishment, the little door in the corner of the bedroom, half open and closed again. I thought to myself that it was probably Mrs. Hall coming to see whether I was comfortable, and I thereupon said, Who's there? There was no sound in answer, but presently, a moment or two after, there followed a disagreeable laughter, 
I thought from the lower regions of the house in the direction of the corner. Come in, whoever you are, I said, and in a moment the door opened and closed, and I became aware that there was someone in the room. Further than that, said Basil to me, in that dreadful hour, it is impossible to go. I can only say that I became aware in a moment of the existence of a world outside of and intertwined with our own, a world of far stronger influences and powers, how far-reaching I know not, but I know this, that all the mortal difficulties and dilemmas that I had hitherto been obliged to meet melted away in the face of a force to which I had hitherto been a stranger. The dreadful recital ended about midnight, and the strange part was to me that our position seemed in some fearful manner to have now been reversed. Basil was now the shrinking, timorous creature who could only implore me not to leave him. It was in such a mood as this that he had written the letter. I asked him what there was to fear. Everything, he said with a shocking look. He would not go to bed. He would not allow me to leave the room. Step by step I unravelled the story, which his incoherent statement had only hinted at. His first emotion had been that of intense fright, but he became aware almost at once that the spirit, who thus so unmistakably came to him, was not inimical to him. The very features of the being, if such a word can be used about so shadowy a thing, appear to wear a smile. Little by little the presence of the visitant had become habitual to Basil. There was a certain pride in his own fearlessness which helped him. Then there was intense and eager curiosity. And then too, said the unhappy man, the influence began to affect me in other ways. I will not tell you how. But the very necessaries of life were provided for me in a manner which I should formerly have condemned with the utmost scorn, but which now... I was given confidence to disregard. The dejection, the languorous reflections we used to hang about me, gradually drew off and left me cheerful, vigorous, and I must say it, delighting in evil imaginations, but so subtle was the evil influence that it was not into any gross corruption or flagrant deeds that I flung myself, it was into my music that the poison flowed. I do not, of course, mean that evil then appeared to me, as I can humbly say it does now, as evil, but rather as a vision of perfect beauty, glorifying every natural function and every corporeal desire. The springs of music rose clear and strong within me, and with the fountain I mingled from my own stores the subtle venom of the corrupted mind. How glorious, I thought, to sway as with a magic wand the souls of men to interpret for each all the eager and leaping desires which may be he had duly and dutifully controlled, to make all things fair, for so potent were the whispers of the spirit that talked to my ear, that I believed in my heart, that all that was natural in man was also permissible and even beautiful, and that it was nothing but a fantastic asceticism that forbids it. Though now I see, as I saw before, that the evil that thwarts mankind is but the slime of the pit, out of which he is but gradually extricating himself. But what is the thing, I said, of which you speak? Is it a spirit of evil, or a human spirit, or, or what? Good God, he said, how can I tell? And then with lifted hand he sang in a strange voice a bar or two from Stanford's Revenge. Was he devil or man? He was devil for aught they knew. This dreadful interlude, the very flippancy of it, that might have moved my laughter at any other time, had acted upon me an indescribably sickening effect. I stared at Basil. He relapsed into a moody silence with clasped hands and knotted brow. To draw him away from the nether darkness of his thoughts, I asked him how and in what shape the spirit had made itself plain to him. Oh, no shape at all, said he. He is there, that is enough. I seem sometimes to see a face, 
to catch the glance of an eye, to see a hand raised to warn, or to encourage. But it is all impossibly remote. I could never explain to you how I see him. Do you see him now? I asked. Yes, said Basil, a long way off, and he is running swiftly to me. But he has far to go yet. He is angry. He threatens me. He beats the air with his hands. But, but where is this? I asked, for Basil's eyes were upon the ground. Oh, for God's sake, man, be silent, said Basil. It is in the region of which you and others know little, but it has been revealed to me. It lies all about us. It has its capes and shadowy peaks, and a leaden sea full of sound. It is there that I ramble with him. There was a silence between us, and I said, But dear Basil, I must ask you this. How was it that you wrote as you did to me? Oh, he made me write, he said, and I think he overreached himself, or oh, my angel, he that beholds the father's face, smote him down. I was myself again on a sudden. The miserable and abject wretch whom you see before you, and knowing that I had been as a man in a dream. Then I wrote the despairing words and guarded the letter so that he could not come near me. And then Mr. Vivian's visit to me, that was not by chance. I gave him the letter, and he promised to bear it faithfully, and what attempts were made to tear it from him I do not know, but that my adversary tried his best I do not doubt. But Vivian is a good man and could not be harmed. And then I fell back into the old spell, and worked still more abundantly and diligently, and produced this, this accursed thing, which shall not live to scatter evil abroad. As he said these words, he rose and tore the score that lay on the table into shreds and crammed the pieces in the fire. As he thrust the last pieces down, the poker he was holding fell from his hands. I saw him, white as a sheet and trembling. What is the matter? I said. He turned a terrible look on me and said, He is here. He has arrived. Then all at once I was aware that there was a sort of darkness in the room, and then with a growing horror I gradually perceived that in and through the room there ran a thing like the front of a precipice, with some dark strand at its foot on which beat a surge of phantom waves. The two scenes struggled together. At one time I could plainly see the cliff front close beside me, and then the lamp and the firelit room was all dimmed even to vanishing, and then suddenly the room would come back and the cliff die into a steep shadow. But in either of the scenes Basil and I were there, he standing irresolute and despairing, glancing from side to side like a hare when the hounds close in, and once he said, this was when the cliff loomed up suddenly, there are others with him. Then in a moment it seemed as if the room in which we sat died away altogether, and I was in that other place. There was a faint light, as from under a stormy sky, and a little farther up the strand there stood a group of dark figures which seemed to consult together. All at once the group broke and came suddenly towards us. I do not know what to call them. They were, they were human in a sense, that is, they walked upright and had heads and hands but the faces were all blurred and fretted, like half-rotted skulls. But there was no sense of comparison in me. I only knew that I had seen ugliness and corruption at the very source, and looked into the darkness of the pit itself. The forms eluded me and rushed upon Basil, who made a motion as though to seize hold of me, and then turned and fled, his arms outstretched, glancing behind him as he ran, and in a moment he was lost to view, though I could see along the shore of that formless sea something like a pursuit. I do not know what happened after that. I think I tried to pray, but I presently became aware that I was myself menaced by danger. It seems, but I speak in parables, as though one had separated himself from the rest and had returned to seek me. But all was over, I knew. The figure indeed carried something which he swung and shook in his hand, which I thought was a token to be shown to me, 
and then I found my voice and cried out with all my strength to God to save me. And in a moment there was the firelit room again, and the lamp, the most peaceful-looking room in England. The basil had left me. The door was wide open, and in a moment the farmer and his wife came hurrying along with blanched faces to ask who it was that had cried out and what had happened. I made some pitiful excuse that I had dozed in my chair and had awoken crying out some unintelligible words, for in the quest I was about to engage in I did not wish that any mortal should be with me. They left me, asking for Mr. Netherby and still not satisfied. Indeed, Mrs. Hall looked at me with so penetrating a look that I felt that she understood something of what had happened, and then at once I went up to Basil's room. I do not know where I found the courage to do it, but the courage came. The room was dark, and a strong wind was blowing through it from the little door. I stepped across the room, feeling my way, went down the stairs, and finding the door open at the bottom, I went out into the snake-like path. I went some yards along it. The moon had risen now. There came a sudden gap in the trees to the left, through which I could see the pale fields in the corner of the wood casting its black shadow on the ground. The shrubs were torn, broken, and trampled, as though some heavy thing had crashed through. I made my way cautiously down, endowed with a more than human strength. It was a steep bank covered with trees. And then, in a moment, I saw Basil. He lay some distance out in the field on his face. I knew, at a glance, that it was all over, and when I lifted him I became aware that he was in some way strangely mangled, and indeed it was found afterwards that though the skin of his body was hardly contused, yet that almost every bone of the body was broken into fragments. I managed to carry him to the house. I closed the doors of the staircase, and then I managed to tell Farmer Hall that Basil had had, I, I thought, a fall, and was dead. And then my own strength failed me, and for three days and nights I lay in a kind of stupor. When I recovered my consciousness, I found myself in bed in my own room. Mrs. Hall nursed me with a motherly care and tenderness which moved me very greatly, but I could not speak of the matter to her until, just before my departure, she came in, as she did twenty times a day, to see if I wanted anything. I made a great effort and said, Mrs. Hall, I am very sorry for you. This has been a terrible business, and I am afraid you won't easily forget it. You ought to leave the house, I think. Mrs. Hall turned her frozen gaze upon me and said, Yes, sir, indeed. I can't speak about it or think of it. I feel as if I might have prevented it, and yet I have been over and over in my mind, and I can't see where I was wrong. But my duty is to the house now, and I shall never leave it. But I will ask you, sir, to try and find a thought of pity in your heart for him. I knew she didn't mean Basil. I don't think he clearly knows what he has done. He must have his will, as he always did. He stopped at nothing, if it was for his pleasure and he didn't know what harm he did. But he is in God's hands, and though I cannot understand why, yet there are things in this life which he allows to be, and we must try not to be judges. We must try to be merciful. But I have not done what I could have done, and if God gives me strength, there shall be an end of this. A few hours later Mr. Vivian called to see me. He was a very different person to the Vivian that had showed himself to me in Hoban. I couldn't talk with him much, but I could see that he had some understanding of the case. He asked me no questions, but he told me a few details. He said that they had decided at the inquest that he had fallen from the terrace, but the doctor who was attending me seems to have said to Mr. Vivian that a fall it must have been, but a fall of a most unconceivable character. And what is more, the old doctor had added, the man was neither in pain nor agitation of mind when he died. The face was absolutely peaceful and tranquil. And the doctor's theory was that he had died from some sudden seizure before the fall. 
and so I held my tongue. One thing I did, it was to have a little slab put over the body of my dead friend, a simple slab with name and date, and I ventured to add one line, because I have no doubt in my own mind that Basil was suddenly delivered, though not from death. He had, I suppose, gone too far upon the dark path, and he could not, I think, have freed himself from the spell, and so the cord was loosed, but loosed in mercy, and so I made them add the words, And in their hands they shall bear thee up. I must add one further word. About a year after the events above recorded, I received a letter from Mr. Vivian, which I give without further comment. St. Sibby, December 18th, 1890 Dear Mr. Ward, I wish to tell you that our friend Mrs. Hall died a few days ago. She was a very good woman, one of the few that are chosen. I was much with her in her last days, and she told me a strange thing, which I cannot bring myself to repeat to you, but she sent you a message which she repeated several times, which she said you would understand. It is simply this. Tell Mr. Ward I have prevailed. I may add that I have no doubt of the truth of her words, as you will know to what I am alluding. The day after she died there was a fire at Traheel. Mr. Hall was absolutely distracted with grief at the loss of his wife, and I do not quite know what happened. But it was impossible to save the house. All that is left of it is a mass of charred ruins, with a few walls standing up. Nothing was saved, not even a picture. There is a wholly inadequate insurance, and I believe it is not intended to rebuild the house. I hope you will bear us in mind, though I know you so little. I shall always feel that we have a common experience which will hold us together. You will try to visit us some day when the memory of what took place is less painful to you. The grass is now green on your poor friend's grave, and I will only add that you will have a warm welcome here. I am just moving into the rectory as my old rector died a fortnight ago, and I have accepted the living. God bless you, dear Mr. Ward. Yours very sincerely, James Vivian The Haunting of Shawley Rectory by Ruth Rendell I don't believe in the supernatural, but just the same, I wouldn't live in Shawley Rectory. That was what I had been thinking and what Gordon Scott said to me when we heard we were to have a new rector at St Mary's. Our wives gave us quizzical looks. Not very logical, said Eleanor, my wife. What I mean is, said Gordon, that however certain you might be that ghosts don't exist, if you lived in a place that was reputedly haunted, you wouldn't be able to help wondering every time you heard a stair creak. All the normal sounds of an old house would take on a, a different significance. I agreed with him. It wouldn't be very pleasant feeling uneasy every time one was alone in one's own home at night. Personally, said Patsy Scott, I've always believed that there are no ghosts in the rectory that a good central heating system wouldn't get rid of. We laughed at that, but Eleanor said, You can't just dismiss it like that. The Cobworths heard and felt things, even if they didn't actually see anything. And so did the Bucklands before them. And you won't find anyone more level-headed than Kate Cobworth. Patsy shrugged. The Loys didn't even hear or feel anything. They'd heard the stories. They expected to hear the footsteps and the carriage wheels, Diana Loy told me. And Diana was quite a nervy, high-strung sort of person. But absolutely nothing happened while they were there. Well, maybe the Church of England or whoever's responsible will install central heating for the new person, I said. And we'll see if your theory's right, Patsy. Ella and I went home after that. We went on foot because our house is only about a quarter of a mile up Shawley Lane. On the way, we stopped in front of the rectory, which is about a hundred yards along. We stood and looked over the gate. I may as well describe the rectory to you before I get on with this story. The date of it's around 1760, and it's built of pale, dun-coloured brick with plain classical windows and a front door in the middle, with a pediment over it. It's a big house with three reception rooms, six bedrooms, two kitchens and two staircases, and one pokey little bathroom made by having converted a linen closet. The house is a bit stark to look at, a bit uh, forbidding. It seems to stare straight back at you. 
But the trees round it are pretty enough, and so are the stables on the left-hand side with a clock in their gable and a weather vane on top. Tom Cobworth, the last rector, kept his old Morris in there. The garden's huge, a wilderness that no one could keep tidy these days. Eight acres of it, including the glebe. It was years since I'd been inside the rectory. I remember wondering if the interior was as shabby and in need of paint as the outside. The windows had that black, blank, hazy look of windows at which no curtains hang, and which no one has cleaned for months or even years. Who exactly does it belong to? said Eleanor. Lazarus College, Oxford, I said. Tom was a fellow of Lazarus. And what about this new man? I don't know, I said. I think uh, all that system of livings has changed, but I'm pretty vague about it. I'm not a churchgoer, not religious at all, really. Perhaps that was why I hadn't got to know the Cobworths all that well. I used to feel a bit uneasy in Tom's company. I used to have the feeling he might suddenly round on me and demand to know why he never saw me in church. Eleanor had no such inhibitions with Kate. They were friends, close friends, and Eleanor had missed her after Tom suddenly died of a heart attack and she had to leave the rectory. She had gone back to her people up north, taking her fifteen-year-old daughter Louise with her. Kate is a practical, down-to-earth Yorkshire woman. She had been a nurse, a ward sister, I believe, before her marriage. When Tom got the living of Shawley, she several times met Mrs. Buckland, the wife of the retiring incumbent, and from her learned to expect what Mrs. Buckland called manifestations. I couldn't believe she was actually saying it, Kate had said to Eleanor. I thought I was dreaming, and then I thought she was mad. I mean, really psychotic, mentally ill. Ghosts, I ask you. People believing in things like that in this day and age. And then we moved in. And I heard them too. The crunch of carriage wheels on the gravel drive, when there was no carriage or any kind of vehicle to be seen. Doors closing softly when no doors had been left open. Footsteps crossing the landing and going downstairs, crossing the hall, then the front door opening softly and closing softly. But how could you bear it, Eleanor said. Weren't you afraid? Weren't you terrified? We got used to it. We had to, you see. It wasn't as if we could sell the house and buy another. Besides, I loved Shawley. I loved it from the first moment I set foot in the village. After the harshness of the north, Dorset so gentle and mild and pretty. The doors closing and the footsteps and the wheels on the drive, it didn't do us any harm. And we had each other. We weren't alone. You can get used to anything, to ghosts as much as to damp and woodworm and dry rot. There's all that in the rectory too, and I found that much more trying. The Bucklands apparently had got used to it too. Thirty years he'd been rector of the parish. Thirty years they'd lived there with the wheels and the footsteps, and had brought up their son and daughter there. No harm had come to them. They slept soundly, and their grown-up children used to joke about their haunted house. Nobody ever seems to see anything, I said to Eleanor as we walked home. And no one ever comes up with a story, a, a sort of background to all this walking about and banging and crunching. Is there supposed to have been a murder there, or some other sort of violent death? She said she didn't know. Kate had never said. The sound of the wheels, the closing of the doors, always took place at about nine in the evening, followed by the footsteps and the opening and closing of the front door. After that, there was silence, and it hadn't happened every evening by any means. The only other thing was that Kate had never cared to use the big drawing room in the evenings. She and Tom and Louise had always stayed in the dining room or the morning room. They did use the drawing room in the daytime. It was just that in the evenings the room felt strange to her, chilly even in summer, and indefinably hostile. Once she had had to go in there at 10.30. She needed her reading glasses, which she'd left in the drawing room during the afternoon. She ran into the room and ran out again. She hadn't looked about her, just rushed in, keeping her eyes fixed on the eyeglass case on the mantelpiece. The icy hostility in that room had really frightened her, and that had been the only time she had felt dislike and fear of Shirley Rectory. Of course, one doesn't have to find explanations for an icy hostility. It's much more easily understood as being the product of tension and fear than oral phenomena are. I didn't have much faith in Kate's feelings about the drawing room, I thought with a kind of admiration of Jack and Diana Loy, that elderly couple who had rented the rectory for a year after Kate's departure, had been primed with stories of hauntings by Kate. 
yet had neither heard nor felt a thing. As far as I know, they had used that drawing-room constantly. Often, when I had passed the gate in their time, I had seen lights in the drawing-room windows at nine, uh, ten-thirty, and even midnight. The Loys had been gone three months when Lazarus had first offered the rectory for rent. The idea had been that surely he should do without a clergyman of its own. I think this must have been the church economising, nothing to do certainly with ghosts. The services at St Mary's were to be undertaken by the vicar of the next parish, Mr Hartley. Whether he found this too much for him in conjunction with the duties of his own parish, or whether the powers that be in affairs Anglican had second thoughts, uh, I can't say. But on the departure of the Loys it was decided there should be an incumbent to replace Tom. The first hint of this we had from local gossip. Next, the facts appeared in our monthly news sheet, the Shawley Post. Couched in its customary parish magazine journalese, it said, Surely residents all extend a hearty welcome to their new rector, the Reverend Stephen Galton, whose coming to the parish with his charming wife will fill a long-felt need. He's very young, said Eleanor, a few days after our discussion of haunting with the Scots. Under thirty. That won't bother me, I said. I don't intend to be preached at by him. Anyway, why not? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, I said, hast thou ordained strength. Hark at the devil, quoting scripture, said Eleanor. They say his wife's only twenty-three. I thought she must have met them, she knew so much, but no. It's just what's being said. Patsy got it from Judy Lawrence. Judy said they're moving in next month and her mother's coming with them. Who, Judy's? Don't be silly, said my wife. Mrs. Galton's mother, the rector's mother-in-law. She's coming to live with them. Move in they did. And out again. Two days later. The first we knew that something had gone very wrong for the Galtons was when I was out for my usual evening walk with our Irish setter, Liam. We were coming back past the cottage that belongs to Charlie Lawrence, who is by way of being surely squire, and which he keeps for the occupation of his gardener when he's lucky enough to have a gardener. At that time, last June, he hadn't had a gardener for at least six months, and the cottage should have been empty. As I approached, however, I saw a woman's face, young, fair, and very pretty, at one of the upstairs windows. I rounded the hedge and Liam began an insane barking for just inside the cottage gate, on the drive, peering in under the hood of an aged Woolsey, was a tall young man wearing a tweed sports jacket over one of those blacktop things the clergy wear, and a clerical collar. Good evening, I said. Shut up, Liam, will you? Uh, good evening, he said in a quiet, abstracted sort of way. I told Eleanor. She couldn't account for the Galtons occupying Charlie Lawrence's gardener's cottage instead of Shirley Rectory, their proper abode. But Patsy Scott could. She came round on the following morning with a punnet of strawberries for us. The Scots grow the best strawberries for miles around. They've been driven out by the ghosts, she said. Can you credit it? A clergyman of the Church of England, an educated man. They were in that place not forty-eight hours before they were screaming to Charlie Lawrence to find them somewhere else to go. I asked her if she was sure it wasn't just the damp and the dry rot. Look, you know me, I don't believe the rectory's haunted or anywhere can be haunted, come to that. I'm telling you what Mrs. Galton told me. She came in to us on Thursday morning and said, did I think there was anyone in Shawley had a house or a cottage to rent? Because they couldn't stick the rectory another night. I asked her what was wrong. And she said she knew it sounded crazy. It did too, she was right there. She knew it sounded mad, but they'd been terrified out of their lives by what they'd heard and seen since they'd moved in. Seen, I said. She actually claims to have seen something. Said her mother did. She said her mother saw something in the drawing room the first evening they were there. They'd already heard the carriage wheels and the doors closing and the footsteps and all that. The second evening, no one dared go in the drawing room. They heard all the sounds again and Mrs. Granger, that's the mother, heard voices in the drawing room, and it was then that they decided they couldn't stand it, they'd have to get out. I don't believe it, I said, I don't believe any of it. The woman's a psychopath, she's playing some sort of ghastly joke. Just as Kate was, and the Bucklands, said Eleanor quietly. Patsy ignored her and turned to me. I feel just like you, it's awful, but what can you do? These stories grow and they sort of infect people. And the more suggestible the people are, the worse the infection. 
Charlie and Judy are furious. They don't want it getting in the papers that surely Rectory is haunted. Think of all the people we shall get coming in cars on Sundays and gawping over the gates. But they had to let them have the cottage in common humanity. Mrs. Granger was hysterical and poor little Mrs. Galton wasn't much better. Who told them to expect all those horrors? That's what I'd like to know. What does Gordon say? I said. He's keeping an open mind, but he says he'd like to spend an evening there. In spite of the Lawrence's fury, the haunting of Shawley Rectory did get quite a lot of publicity. There was a sensational story about it in one of the popular Sundays, and then Stephen Galton's mother-in-law went on television. Western TV interviewed her in a local news programme. I hadn't ever seen Mrs. Granger in the flesh, and her youthful appearance rather surprised me. She looked no more than thirty-five, though she must be into her forties. The interviewer asked her if she'd ever heard any stories of ghosts at Shawley Rectory before she went there, and she said she hadn't. Did she believe in ghosts? Now she did. What had happened? asked the interviewer, after they'd moved in. It had started at nine o'clock, she said, at nine on their first evening. She and her daughter were sitting in the bigger of the two kitchens, having a cup of coffee. They had been moving in all day, unpacking, putting things away. They heard two doors close upstairs, then footsteps coming down the main staircase. She thought it was her son-in-law, except that it couldn't have been, because as the footsteps died away, he came in through the door from the back kitchen. They couldn't understand what it had been, but they weren't frightened. Not then. We were planning on going to bed early, said Mrs. Granger. She was very articulate, very much at ease in front of the camera. Just about half past ten, I had to go into the big room they call the drawing room. The removal men had put some of our boxes in there, and my radio was in one of them. I wanted to listen to my radio in bed. I opened the drawing room door and put my hand to the light switch. I didn't put the light on. The moon was quite bright that night, and it was shining into the room. There were two people, two figures, I don't know what to call them, between the windows. One of them, the girl, was lying huddled on the floor. The other figure, an older woman, was bending over her. She stood up when I opened the door and looked at me. I knew I wasn't seeing real people. I don't know how, but I knew that. I remember I couldn't move my hand to switch the light on. I was frozen, just staring at that pale, tragic face while it stared back at me. I did manage at last to back out and close the door, and I got back to my daughter and my son-in-law in the kitchen, and I, well, I collapsed. It was the most terrifying experience of my life. Yet you stayed a night and a day and another night in the rectory, said the interviewer. Yes, well, her daughter and her son-in-law had persuaded her it must have been some sort of hallucination, the consequence of being overtired. Not that she'd ever really believed that. The night had been quiet, and so had the next day until nine in the evening, when they were all this time in the morning room, and they heard a car drive up to the front door. They'd all heard it, wheels crunching on the gravel, the sound of the engine, the brakes going on. Then had followed the closing of the doors upstairs and the footsteps, the opening and closing of the front door. Yes, they had been very frightened, or she and her daughter had. Her son-in-law had made a thorough search of the whole house, but found nothing seen or heard no one. At ten-thirty they'd all gone into the hall and listened outside the drawing-room door, and she and her daughter had heard voices from inside the room, women's voices. Stephen had wanted to go in, but they'd stopped him, they'd been so frightened. Now the interesting thing was that there had been something in the Sunday Express account about the rectory being haunted by the ghosts of two women. The story quoted someone it described as a local antiquarian, a man named Joseph Lamb, whom I'd heard of but never met. Lamb had told the Express there was an old tradition that the ghosts were of a mother and her daughter, and that the mother had killed the daughter in the drawing room. I never heard any of that before, I said to Gordon Scott, and I'm sure Kate Cobworth hadn't. Who is this Joseph Lamb? Oh, he's a nice chap, said Gordon, and he's supposed to know more of local history than anyone else around. I'll ask him over and you can come and meet him if you like. Joseph Lamb lives in a rather fine Jacobean house in a hamlet, he could hardly call it a village, about a mile to the north of Shawley. I had often admired it without knowing who lived there. The Scots asked him and his wife to dinner shortly after Mrs. Granger's appearance on television, and after dinner we got him on to the subject of the hauntings. 
Lamb wasn't at all unwilling to enlighten us. He's a man of about sixty and said he first heard the story of the two women from his nurse when he was a little boy. Not a very suitable subject with which to regale a seven-year-old, he said. These two were supposed to have lived in a rectory at one time, he said. The story is that the mother had a lover or a man-friend or whatever, and the daughter took him away from her. When the daughter confessed it, the mother killed her in a jealous rage. It was Eleanor who objected to this. But surely if they lived in the rectory, they must have been the wife and daughter of a rector. I don't really see how in those circumstances the mother could have had a lover or the daughter could steal him away. No, it doesn't sound much like what we've come to think of as the domestic life of the English country parson, does it? said Lamb. And the strange thing is, although my nanny used to swear by the story, and I heard it later from someone who worked at the rectory, I haven't been able to find any trace of these women in the rectory's history. It's not hard to research, you see, because only the rectors of Shawley had ever lived there until Lloyd's rented it, and the rectors' names are all up on that plaque in the church from 1380 onwards. There was another house on the site before this present one, of course, and parts of the older building are incorporated in the newer. My nanny used to say that the elder lady hadn't got a husband. He had presumably died. She was supposed to be forty years old and the girl nineteen. Well, I tracked back through the families of the various rectors, and I found a good many cases where the rectors had predeceased their wives, but none of them fitted my nanny's story. They were either too old, or one was much too young, or their daughters were too old, or they had no daughters. It's a pity Mrs. Granger didn't tell us what kind of clothes her ghosts were wearing, said Patsy with sarcasm. You could have pinpointed the date then, couldn't you? You mean that if the lady had had a steeple hat on, she'd be medieval, or around 1850 if she was wearing a crinoline? Something like that, said Patsy. At this point, Gordon repeated his wish to spend an evening in the rectory. I think I'll write to the Master of Lazarus and ask permission, he said. Very soon after, we heard that the rectory was to be sold. Notice boards appeared by the front gate, and at the corner where the glebe abutted Shawley Lane, announcing that the house would go up for auction on October the 30th. Patsy, who always seems to know everything, told us that a reserve price of £60,000 had been put on it. Not as much as I'd expected, she said. It must be the ghosts keeping the price down. Whoever buys it will have to spend another 10000 on it, said Eleanor, and central heating will be a priority. Whatever was keeping the price down, ghosts, cold, or dry rot, there were plenty of people anxious to view the house and land with, I suppose, an idea of buying it. I could hardly be at work in my garden or out with Liam without a car stopping and the driver asking me the way to the rectory. Gordon and Patsy got quite irritable about what they described as crowds milling about in the lane and trippers everywhere, waving orders to view. The estate agents handling the sale were a firm called Curlew Pond and Co. Gordon didn't bother with the master of Lazarus, but managed to get the key from Graham Curlew, whom he knew quite well, and permission to spend an evening in the rectory. Curlew didn't like the idea of anyone staying the night, but Gordon didn't want to do that anyway. No one had ever heard or seen anything after 10.30. He asked me if I'd go with him. Patsy wouldn't. She thought it was all too adolescent and stupid. Of course I will, I said. As long as you'll agree to our taking some sort of heating arrangement with us and brandy in case of need. By then it was the beginning of October and the evenings were turning cool. The day on which we decided to have our vigil happened also to be the one on which Stephen Galton and his wife moved out of Charlie Lawrence's cottage and left Shawley for good. According to the Shawley Post, he had got a living in Manchester. Mrs. Granger had gone back to her own home in London, from where she had written an article about the rectory for psychic news. Patsy shrieked with laughter to see the two of us setting forth with our oil stove, a dozen candles, two torches and half a bottle of Courvoisier. She did well to laugh. Her amusement wasn't misplaced. We crossed the lane and opened the rectory gate and went up the gravel drive on which those spirit wheels had so often been heard to crunch. It was seven o'clock in the evening and still light. The day had been fine and the sky was red with the aftermath of a spectacular sunset. I unlocked the front door and in we went. The first thing I did was put a match to one of the candles because it wasn't at all light inside. We walked down the passage to the kitchens, I carrying the candle 
and Gordon shining one of the torches across the walls. The place was a mess. I suppose it hadn't had anything done to it, not even a cleaning since the Lois moved out. It smelled damp, and there was even fungus growing in patches on the kitchen walls, and it was extremely cold. There was a kind of deathly chill in the air, far more of a chill than one would have expected on a warm day in October. The kitchen had the feel you get when you open the door of a refrigerator that hasn't been kept too clean and is in need of defrosting. We put our stuff down on the kitchen table someone had left behind and made our way up the back stairs. All the bedroom doors were open and we closed them. The upstairs had a neglected, dreary feel, but it was less cold. We went down the main staircase, a rather fine curving affair with elegant banisters and carved newel posts, and entered the drawing room. It was empty, palely lit by the evening light from two windows. On the mantelpiece was a glass jar with greenish water in it, a half-burnt candle in the saucer, and a screwed-up paper table napkin. We had decided not to remain in this room, but to open the door and look in at 10.30, so accordingly we returned to the kitchen, fetched our candles and torches and brandy, and settled down in the morning room, which was at the front of the house on the other side of the front door. Curlew had told Gordon there were a couple of deck chairs in this room. We found them resting against the wall and put them up. We lit our oil stove and a second candle, and we set one candle on the window sill and one on the floor between us. It was still and silent and cold. The dark closed in fairly rapidly, the red fading from the sky, which became a deep hard blue, then indigo. We sat and talked. It was about the haunting that we talked, collating the various pieces of evidence, assessing the times this or that was supposed to happen, and making sure we both knew the sequence in which things happened. We were both wearing watches, and I remember that we constantly checked the time. At half past eight, we again opened the drawing room door and looked inside. The moon had come up and was shining through the windows as it had shone for Mrs. Granger. Gordon went upstairs with the torch and checked that all the doors remained closed, and then we both looked into the other large downstairs room, the dining room, I suppose. Here, a fanlight in one of the windows was open. That accounted for some of the feeling of cold and damp, Gordon said. The window must have been opened by some prospective buyer viewing the place. We closed it and went back into the morning room to wait. The silence was absolute. We didn't talk any more. We waited, watching the candles and the glow of the stove which had taken some of the chill from the air. Outside it was pitch dark. The hands of our watches slowly approached nine. At three minutes to nine, we heard the noise. Not wheels or doors closing or a tread on the stairs, but a faint, dainty, pattering sound. It was very faint. It was distant. It was on the ground floor. It was as if made by something less than human, lighter than that, tiptoeing. I had never thought about this moment beyond telling myself that if anything did happen, If there was a manifestation, it would be enormously interesting. It had never occurred to me, even once, that I should be so dreadfully, so hideously afraid. I didn't look at Gordon. I I couldn't. I couldn't move either. The pattering feet were less faint now, were coming closer. I felt myself go white, the blood all drawn in from the surface of my skin, as I was gripped by that awful, primitive terror that has nothing to do with reason or with knowing what you believe in and what you don't. Gordon got to his feet and stood there looking at the door, and then I couldn't stand it any more. I jumped up and threw open the door, holding the candle aloft, and looked into a pair of brilliant golden-green eyes staring steadily back at me, about a foot from the ground. "'My God,' said Gordon, "'my God, it's Lawrence's cat. It must have got in through the window.' He bent down and picked up the cat, a soft, stout, marmalade-coloured creature. I felt sick with the anticlimax. The time was exactly nine o'clock. With the cat draped over his arm, Gordon went back into the morning room, and I followed him. We didn't sit down. We stood waiting for the wheels and the closing of the doors. Nothing happened. I have no business to keep you in suspense any longer, for the fact is that after the business with the cat, nothing happened at all. 
At 9.15 we sat down in our deck chairs. The cat lay on the floor beside the oil stove and went to sleep. Twice we heard a car pass along Shorley Lane, a remotely distant sound. But we heard nothing else. Feel like a spot of brandy, said Gordon. Why not, I said. So we each had a nip of brandy, and at ten we had another look in the drawing room. By then we were both feeling bored and quite sure that since nothing had happened at nine, nothing would happen at ten-thirty either. Of course we stayed till ten-thirty, and for half an hour after that, and then we decamped. We put the cat over the wall into Lawrence's grounds and went back to Gordon's house where Patsy awaited us, smiling cynically. I had had quite enough of the rectory, but that wasn't true of Gordon. He said it was well known that the phenomena didn't take place every night. We had simply struck an off night, and he was going back on his own. He did too, half a dozen times between then and the 30th, even going so far as to have, rather unethically, a key cut from the one curl you had lent him. Patsy would never go with him, though he tried hard to persuade her. But in all those visits he never saw or heard anything, and the effect on him was to make him as great a sceptic as Patsy. I have a good mind to make an offer for the rectory myself, he said. It's a fine house, and I've got rather attached to it. You're not serious, I said. I'm perfectly serious. I'll go to the auction with a view to buying it, if I can get Patsy to agree. But Patsy preferred her own house, and very reluctantly Gordon had to give up the idea. The rectory was sold for £62,000 to an American woman, a friend of Judy Lawrence. About a month after the sale, the builders moved in. Eleanor used to get progress reports from Patsy, how they had rewired and treated the whole place for woodworm and painted and relayed floors. The central heating engineers came too, much to Patsy's satisfaction. We met Carol Marcus, the rectory's new owner, when we were asked round to the hall for drinks one Sunday morning. She was staying there with the Lawrences until such time as the improvements and decorations to the rectory were complete. We were introduced by Judy to a very pretty, well-dressed woman in young middle age. I asked her when she expected to move in. April, she hoped, as soon as the builders had finished the two extra bathrooms. She had heard rumours that the rectory was supposed to be haunted, and these had amused her very much. A haunted house in the English countryside. It was too good to be true. It's all nonsense, you know, said Gordon, who had joined us. It's all purely imaginary. And he went on to tell her of his own experiences in the house during October, or his non-experiences, I should say. Well, for goodness sake, I didn't believe it, she said, and she laughed and went on to say how much she loved the house and wanted to make it a real home for her children to come to. She had three, she said, all in their teens, two boys away at school and a girl a bit older. That was the only time I ever talked to her, and I remember thinking she would be a welcome addition to the neighbourhood, a nice woman. Serene is the word that best described her. There was a man friend of hers there too. I didn't catch his surname, but she called him Guy. He was staying at one of the local hotels, to be near her, presumably. I should think those two would get married, wouldn't you? said Eleanor, on the way home. Judy told me she's waiting to get her divorce. Later that day, I took Liam for a walk along Shorley Lane, and when I came to the rectory, I found the gate open. So I walked up the gravel drive and looked through the drawing-room window at the new woodblock floor and ivory-painted walls and radiators. The place was swiftly being transformed. It was no longer sinister or grim. I walked round the back and peered in at the splendidly fitted kitchens, one a laundry now, and wondered what on earth had made sensible women like Mrs. Buckland and Kate spread such vulgar tales and the Galtons panic. What had come over them? I could only imagine that they felt a need to attract attention to themselves, which they perhaps could do in no other way. I whistled for Liam and strolled down to the gate and looked back at the rectory. It stared back at me. Is it hindsight that makes me say this, or did I really feel it then? I think I did feel it, that the house stared at me with a kind of steady insolence. Carol Marcus moved in three weeks ago, on a sunny day in the middle of April. Two nights later, just before eleven, there came a sustained ringing at Gordon's front door as if someone were leaning on the bell. Gordon went to the door. Carol Marcus stood outside, absolutely calm but deathly white. She said to him, May I use your phone, please? Mine isn't in yet, and I, I have to call the police. 
I just shot my daughter. She took a step forward and crumpled in a heap on the threshold. Gordon picked her up and carried her into the house, and Patsy gave her brandy. And then he went across the road to the rectory. There were lights on all over the house. The front door was open and light was streaming out onto the drive and the little Citroen Diane that was parked there. He went into the house. The drawing room door was open and he walked in there and saw a young girl lying on the carpet between the windows. She was dead. There was blood from a bullet wound in the front of her dress and on a low round table lay the small automatic that Carol Marcus had used. In the meantime, Patsy had been the unwilling listener to a confession. Carol Marcus told her that the girl, who was nineteen, had unexpectedly driven down from London, arriving at the rectory at nine o'clock. She had had her drink and something to eat, and then said she had something to tell her mother. That was why she had come down. While in London, she had been seeing a lot of the man called Guy, and now they found that they were in love with each other. She knew it would hurt her mother, but she wanted to tell her at once. She wanted to be honest about it. Carol Marcus told Patsy she felt nothing. No shock, no hatred or resentment, no jealousy. It was as if she were impelled by some external force to do what she did. Take the gun she always kept with her from a drawer in the writing desk and kill her daughter. At this point Gordon came back and they phoned the police. Within a quarter of an hour the police were at the house. They arrested Carol Marcus and took her away, and now she's on remand, awaiting trial, on a charge of murder. So what is the explanation of all this? Or does there in fact have to be an explanation? Eleanor and I were so shocked by what had happened, and awed too, that for a while we were somehow wary of talking about it even to each other. Then Eleanor said, It's as if all this time the coming event cast its shadow before it, I nodded, but it didn't seem quite that to me. It was more that the rectory was waiting for the right people to come along, the people who would fit its still unplayed scenario, the woman of forty, the daughter of nineteen, the lover. And only to those who approximated these characters could it show shadows and whispers of the drama. The closer the approximation, the clearer the sounds and signs. The Loys were old and childless, so they saw nothing. Nor did Gordon and I. We were of the wrong sex. But the Bucklands, who had had a daughter, heard and felt things, and so did Kate, though she was too old for the tragic leading role, and her adolescent girl too young for victim. The Galtons had been nearly right. Had Mrs. Granger once hoped the young rector would marry her before he showed his preference for her daughter? but the women had been a few years too senior for the parts. Even so, they had come closer to participation than those before them. All this is very fanciful, and I haven't mentioned a word of it to Gordon and Patsy. They wouldn't listen if I did. They persist in seeing the events of three weeks ago as no more than a sordid murder, a crime of jealousy committed by someone whose mind was disturbed. But I haven't been able to keep from asking myself what would have happened if Gordon had bought the rectory when he talked of doing so. Patsy will be forty this year. I don't think I've mentioned that she has a daughter by her first marriage uh, who's away at the university and going on nineteen now. A girl that they say is extravagantly fond of Gordon. He's talking once more of buying since Carol Marcus, whatever may become of her, will hardly keep the place now. The play is played out. But need that mean that there will never be a repeat performance? Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody dies, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? You tried. How do the dead come back? Monkshood Manor by L. P. Hartley. He's a strange man, said Nestor. Strange what way, I asked. Oh, just neurotic. He has a fire complex or something of the kind. He lies awake at night, thinking that a spark may have jumped out through the fire garden and set the carpets alight. Then he has to get up and go down to look. Sometimes he does this several times a night, even after the fire's gone out. Does he keep an open fire in his own house, I asked. Yes, he does, because it's healthier, and other people like it and he doesn't want to give away to himself about it. 
He sounds a man of principle, I observed. He is, my hostess said. I think that's half the trouble with Victor. If he would let himself go more, he wouldn't have these fancies. They're his subconscious mind punishing him, he says, by making him do what he doesn't want to. But somebody has told him that if he could embrace his neurosis and really enjoy it, I laughed. I don't mean it in that way, said Nesta severely. What a mind you have, Hugo. And he conscientiously tries to, as if anyone could enjoy leaving a nice warm bed and creeping down cold passages to look after a fire that you pretty well know is out. Are you sure that it is a fire he looks at? I asked. I can think of another reason for creeping down a cold passage and embracing what lies at the other end of it. Nesta ignored this. It's not only fire, she said. It's gas taps, electric light switches, anything that he thinks might start a blaze. But seriously, Nesta, I said, there might be some method in his madness. It gives him an alibi for all sorts of things besides lovemaking, theft, for instance, or murder. You say that because you don't know Victor, Nesta said. He's almost a Buddhist. He wouldn't hurt a fly. Does he want people to know about his uh, peculiarity? I asked. I know he's told you. He does and he doesn't, Nesta answered. It's obvious why he doesn't. It isn't so obvious why he does, I observed. It's rather complicated, Nesta said. I doubt if your terre terre mind would understand it. The whole thing is mixed up in his mind with guilt. There you are, exclaimed. Yes, but not real guilt. And he thinks that if someone caught him prowling about at night, they might, I should jolly well think they would. And besides, he doesn't want to keep it a secret, festering. He would rather people laughed at him. Laugh, I repeated. I can't see that it's a laughing matter. No, it isn't really. It all goes back to old Oedipus, I expect. Most men suffer from that, more or less. I expect you do, Hugo. Me, I protested. My father died before I was born. How could I have killed him? Don't understand, said Nesta pityingly. But what I wanted to say was, if you should hear an unusual noise at night, yes, or happen to see somebody walking about, yes, you'll know it's nothing to be alarmed at. It's just Victor taking what he calls his uh, safety precautions. I'll count to three before I fire, I said. Nesta and I had been taking a walk before the other weekend guests arrived. The house came into sight, long and low, with mullioned windows crouching beyond the lawn. This was my first visit to Nesta's comparatively new home. She was always changing houses. Leaving the subject of Victor, we talked with the other guests of their matrimonial intentions, prospects, or entanglements. Our conversation had the pre-war air which Nesta could always command. Is Walter here? I asked. Walter was her husband. No, he's away shooting. He doesn't come here very much, as you know. He never cared for Monksford. I don't know why. Oh, by the way, Hugo, she went on, I have an apology to make to you. I never put any books in your room. I know you're a great reader, but I'm not, I said. I go to bed to sleep. She smiled. Then that's all right. Would you like to see the room? I said I would. It's called the Blue Bachelor's Room, and it's on the ground floor. We joked a bit about the name. Bachelors are always in a slight funk, I said, because of the designing females stalking them. But why didn't you give the room to Victor? It might have saved him several journeys up and down the stairs. It's rather isolated, she said. I know you don't mind that, but he does. Was that the real reason? I asked, but she refused to answer. I didn't meet Victor Chisholm until we assembled for drinks before dinner. He was a nondescript-looking man, neither dark nor fair, tall nor short, fat nor thin, young nor old. I didn't have much conversation with him, but he seemed to slide off any subject when brought up. He didn't drop it like a hot coal, but after a little blowing on it for politeness's sake, he quietly extinguished it. At least that was the impression I got. He smiled quite a lot, as though to prove he was not unsociable, and then retired into himself. He seemed to be saving himself up for something, a struggle with his neurosis, perhaps. After dinner we played bridge, and Victor followed us into the library, half meaning to play, I think, but when he found there was a four without him, he went back into the drawing-room to join the three non-bridge-playing members of the party. We sat up late trying to finish the last rubber, and I didn't see him again before we went to bed. The library had a large open fireplace in which a few logs were smouldering over a heap of wood ash. The room had a shut-in feeling, largely because the door was lined with book bindings to make it look like shelves, so that when it was closed, 
you couldn't tell where it was. Towards midnight I asked Nesta if I should put another log on, and she said carelessly, No, I shouldn't bother. We're bound to get finished sometime, and you'll promise me not to overbid Hugo, which reminded me of Victor and his complex. So when at last we did retire, I said meaningly, Would you like me to take a look at the drawing room fire, Nesta? Well, you might, but it'll be out by this time, she said. And the dining room? I pursued, glancing at the others to see if there was any reaction, which there was not. She frowned slightly and said, The dining room's electric. We only run to two real fires, and then we separated. In spite of my boasting, for some reason, I couldn't get to sleep. I tossed to and fro, every now and then turning the light on to see what time it was. My bedroom walls were painted dark blue, but by artificial light they looked almost black. They were so shiny and translucent that when I sat up in bed I could see my reflection in them, or at any rate my shadow. I grew tired of this, and then it occurred to me that if I'd had a book I might read myself to sleep. It was one of the recognised remedies for insomnia, but I hadn't. There were two bookends, soapstone elephants, I remember, facing each other across an empty space. I gave myself till half past two, then I got up, put on my dressing gown and opened the bedroom door. All was in darkness. The library lay at the other end of the long house, and to reach it I had to cross the hall. I had no torch and didn't know where the switches were, so my progress was slow. I tried to make as little noise as possible. But then I remembered that if Nesta heard me, she would think I was Victor Chisholm going his nightly rounds. After this I grew bolder and almost at once found the central switch panel at the foot of the staircase. This lit up the passage to the library. The library door was open and in I went, automatically fumbling for the switch. But no sooner had my hand touched the wall than it fell to my side, for I had a feeling that I was not alone in the room. I don't know what it was based on, but something was already implicit in my vision before it became physically clear to me, a figure at the far end of the room, in the deep alcove of the fireplace, bending, almost crouching over the fire. The figure had its back to me and was so near to the fire as to be almost in it. Whether it made a movement or not I couldn't tell, but a spurt of flame started up against which the figure showed darker than before. I knew it must be Victor Chisholm, and I stifled an impulse to say hello from a confused feeling that, like a sleepwalker, he ought not to be disturbed. It would startle and humiliate him. But I wanted a book, and my groping fingers found one. I withdrew it from the shelf, but not quite noiselessly, for with the tail of my eye I saw the figure move. Back in my room I wondered if I ought to have left the hall lights on for Victor's return journey, but at once concluded that as he hadn't turned them on himself, he knew his way well enough not to need them. A sense of achievement possessed me. I had caught my fellow guest out, and I had got my book. It turned out to be the fourth volume of John Evelyn's diary, but I hadn't read more than a few sentences before I fell asleep. When I met Victor Chisholm at breakfast, I meant to ask him how he had slept. It was an innocent, conventional inquiry, but somehow I couldn't bring myself to put it. Instead, we congratulated each other on the bright, frosty, late October morning, almost as if we had been responsible for it. Presently, the two other men joined us, but none of the ladies of the party, and lacking their conversational stimulus, we relapsed into silence over our newspapers but I didn't want to keep my adventure to myself, and later in the morning, when I judged that Nesta would not be preoccupied with household management, I waylaid her. Your friend Victor Chisholm has been on the tiles again, I began, and before she could get a word in, I told her the story of last night's encounter. Halfway through I was afraid it might fall flat, for after all her guest's peculiarities were no news to her, but it didn't. She looked surprised and faintly worried. I oughtn't to have told you, I said with assumed contrition, but I thought it would amuse you. She made an effort to smile. Oh, well, it does, she said, and then her serious look came back. But there's one thing that puzzles me. What's that? He told me he had a very good night. Oh, well, he would say that. It's only civil if you're staying at someone's house. I should have said the same if you'd asked me, only I thought you'd want to hear about Victor. Nestor didn't take this up. But we know each other much too well, she said, arguing with herself. 
Victor comes down here. Well, he comes pretty often, and he always tells me if he's been taking his security measures. I can't understand it. Why does she seem so upset? I ask myself. Does she care more for Victor than she admits? Is she distressed by the thought that he should lie to her? Does she suspect him of infidelity? Oh, I expect he thought for once he wouldn't bother you, I said. You're quite sure it was Victor? she asked with an effort. I opened my eyes. Who else could it have been? Well, uh, somebody else looking for a book. I said I thought this most unlikely. Besides, he wasn't looking for a book. He was looking at the fire. I think he stirred it up with his foot. Stirred it with his foot? Well, something made a flame jump up. Nesta said nothing, but looked more anxious than before. Hoping to make her say something that would enlighten me, I observed jokingly, But he's come to the right place. I saw a row of buckets in the hall and one of those patent fire extinguishers. Oh, Walter insisted on having them, said Nesta hurriedly. This is a very old house, you know, and we have to take reasonable precautions. Having a fire complex doesn't mean there isn't such a thing as having a fire. Any more than having persecution mania means there isn't such a thing as persecution. Then I remembered something. If he doesn't want to be taken for a burglar, I said, why doesn't he turn on the lights? But he does turn them on, said Nesta, just for that reason. I shook my head. He didn't turn them on last night. The problem of Victor's nocturnal ramblings exercised me and made me unsociable. I never enjoyed a sultry conversation, and our pre-lunch and chit-chat seemed to me unusually insipid. So when the meal was over, I excused myself from playing golf, though I had brought my clubs with me, and announced that I was going to have a siesta as I had slept badly. There was a murmur of sympathy, but Nesta made no comment, and no one, least of all Victor, betrayed uneasiness. In the middle of the afternoon I woke up and had an idea. I strode down to the village to search out the oldest inhabitant. To my surprise I found him, or his equivalent, digging in his front garden. Leaning over the wall I engaged him in conversation, and very soon he told me what I had somehow expected to hear. Like so many pieces of knowledge that one picks up, it was difficult to act upon, and I rather wished I had never heard it. What chiefly intrigued me was the question, did Victor know what I knew? It was clear, I thought, that Nesta did. But had she told him? I didn't think that I could ask her. It would seem too like prying. Besides, if she had wanted to tell me, she would have told me. What I had heard could be held to explain a good many things. My secret gnawed at me and made the social contacts of the party seem unreal, as though I were a communist in the government office, my only accomplice being the head of the department. Suddenly after tea, I think it was, the conversation turned my way. Is the house haunted, Nesta? asked one of the visitors, a woman, who, like myself, was a stranger to the house. It ought to be. It wouldn't be complete without a ghost. I watched Nesta as she answered carefully. No, I'm afraid I must disappoint you. It isn't. And I watched Victor Chisholm, but he kept what might have been called his poker face, if it had been sinister, which it was not. The speaker wasn't to be satisfied. She returned to the charge more than once, suggesting various phantoms suitable to Monkshood Manor, but Nesta disowned them all, finally suppressing them with a yawn. One by one, on various pretexts, the company disbanded, and Victor Chisholm and I were left alone. I once stayed in a country house that was said to be haunted, I remarked chattily. Oh, did you? he said, with his air of being politely pleased to listen while he was saving himself up for something in which one had no concern. Uh, was it fun? Well, not exactly fun, I said. I'll tell you about it, if you can bear to hear. The house was an old one, like this, and the land on which it stood had belonged to the church. Well, after the dissolution of the monasteries, they pulled the abbey, or whatever it was, down, and used some of the stones for building this house I'm telling you about. Nobody could stop them. But one of the old monks who'd fallen into poverty as a result of being dissolved, and who remembered the bygone days when they feasted and sang and wassailed and got fat and clapped each other on the back in the way you see in the pictures, he felt sore about it, and on his deathbed he laid a curse on the place, and swore that four hundred years later he would come back from wherever he was and set fire to it. I watched Victor Chisholm for some sign of uneasiness but he showed none, and all he said was, 
Do you think a ghost could do that? I have always understood that it isn't very easy to set a house on fire. It isn't very easy to light a fire, is it, when it's been laid for a purpose with paper and sticks and so on. This, I thought, and I congratulated myself upon my subtlety, is the voice of reassurance speaking. This is what well-meaning people tell him, and what he tells himself, hoping to calm his fears. I I'm not up on the subject of ghosts, I said, but they can clank chains, and presumably some of them come from a hot place and wouldn't mind handling a burning brand or two, or kicking one. That fire in the library, for instance. Oh, oh, but surely, he said, and I saw that I had scared him. The library fire's absolutely safe. I I'm sometimes nervous about fires myself, but I should never bother about that one. There's so much stone flagging around it. Do, do you really think? Oh, I have no idea, I said, feeling I had the answer to one of my questions. But my hostess at the time was certainly apprehensive. I had to worm the story out of her. It's a very unusual one, of course, almost the regulation legend, very boring, really. And was the house ever burnt down? asked Victor. Oh, I never heard, I said. Of course, Victor might have been dissembling. He might have known the legend of Monkshood Manor. He might have been afraid of the library fire. Neurotic people are notoriously given to lying. But I don't think so. Yet the alternative was too fantastic. I couldn't believe in it either. And gradually, for logic and sometimes be bluffed, I succeeded in disbelieving both alternatives at once. Before nightfall, I took the precaution of furnishing my blue room with books more interesting than Evelyn's diary, but I didn't need them. I slept excellently, and so, to judge from discreet inquiries I made in the morning, did the rest of the party. I couldn't get much out of Nesta. She rather avoided me, and for the first time in my life I felt like a policeman who must be treated with reserve in case he finds out too much. I still persuaded myself that Victor Chisholm had been and had not been in the library in the early hours of Saturday morning. If pressed, I should have said he had been. The third possibility, put forward by Nesta, that another guest had been searching for a book, I dismissed. My theory was that Nesta had a superstitious dread of a fire breaking out at Monkshood Manor and was keeping Victor in ignorance while she availed herself of his services as a night watchman without warning him of the risk he ran. Risk? There was no risk, yet I vaguely felt that I ought to do something about it, so I tried to make my social prevail over my private conscience and throw myself into the collective life of a weekend party. I thought about the form my coming Collins would take, and wondered if I ought to apologise for being a dull guest. In the meantime, I could search Nesta out and make amends for something that I felt had been slightly critical in my attitude towards her. My quest took me to the library. Nesta was not there, but someone was. A housemaid on her hands and knees, working vigorously at the carpet with a dustpan and brush. Good heavens, I exclaimed, surprised into speech by the sight of such antiquated cleaning methods. Haven't you got a vacuum cleaner? The maid, who was pretty, looked up and said, Yes, but it won't bring these marks out. Really, I said, what sort of marks are they? I don't know, said the maid, but they look like footmarks. I bent down. They did look like footmarks, but they had another peculiarity, which for some reason I refrained from commenting on. Instead, I said, glancing at the fireplace, Looks like someone has been paddling in the ashes. That's what I think, she said, leaning back to study the marks on the carpet. Well, it's clean dirt, I observed, and should come off all right. Yes, it should, she agreed, but it doesn't. It's my belief that it's been burned in. Oh, no, I assured her, but curiosity overcame me, and I, too, got down on my hands and knees and buried my nose in the carpet. Hugo, what are you doing? said Nesta's voice behind me. I jumped up guiltily. What were you doing? she repeated almost sternly. I had an inspiration. To tell you the truth, I said, I wanted to know whether this lovely Persian carpet had been dyed with an aniline dye. There's only one way to tell you now, by licking it. Aniline tastes sour. And does it? asked Nesta. Not in the least. I'm glad of that, said Nesta, and leading me from the room, she began to tell me the history of the carpet. This gave me the opportunity to praise the house and all its appointments. What treasures you have, Nesta, I wound up. I hope to have fully insured. Yes, they are, 
she answered rather dryly. But I didn't know you were an expert on carpets, Hugo. As soon as I could, I returned to the library. The maid had done her work well, hardly a trace of the footmarks remained, and the smell of burning which I thought I had detected clinging to them had quite worn off. You could still see the track they made, away from the fireplace towards the door, but they didn't reach the door or go in a direct line for it. They stopped at a point halfway between, against the inner wall which was sheathed in books. There was nothing surprising in that. After a few steps the ashes would have been all rubbed off. And there was another thing I couldn't see, and almost wondered if I had seen it, the mark of the big toe, which showed that the feet had been bare. Victor might have come down in his bare feet to avoid making a noise, but it was odd all the same, if not as odd as I had first thought it. In the afternoon we went on a long motor drive in two cars to have tea with a neighbour. As soon as Monkshood Manor was out of sight, its problems began to fade, and in the confusion of the two parties joining forces round the tea table they seemed quite unreal and even when the house came into view again, stretched cat-like beyond the lawn, I only felt a twinge of my former uneasiness. By Sunday evening a weekend visit seemed almost over. The threads with one's temporary residence are snapping. Mentally one is already in next week. Before I got into bed, I took out my diary and checked up my engagements, they were quite ordinary engagements for luncheon and dinner and so on, but suddenly they seemed extraordinarily desirable. I fixed my mind on them and went to sleep thinking of them. I even dreamed about them, or one of them. It started as an ordinary dinner party, but one of the guests was late and we had to wait for him. Who is he? someone asked. And our host answered, I don't know. He'll tell us when he comes. Everyone seemed to accept this answer as reasonable and satisfactory, and we hung about talking and sipping cocktails until our host said, I don't think he can be coming after all. We won't wait any longer. But just as we were sitting down to dinner, there was a knock at the door, and a voice said, May I come in? And then I saw that we weren't at my friend's house in London, but back again at Monkshood, and the door that was opening was the library door, which was lined with bindings to make it look like bookshelves. For some reason it wasn't at the end of the wall, but in the middle, and I said, Why is he coming in by that door? Because it's the door he used to use, somebody answered. The door was a long time opening, and it seemed to be opening by itself, with nobody behind it. Then came a hand and a sleeve, and a figure wearing a monk's cowl. I woke with a start and was at once aware of a strong smell. For a moment I thought it was the smell of cooking, and wondered if it could be breakfast time. If so, the cook had burnt something, for there was a smell of burning too. But it couldn't be breakfast time, for not a glimmer of light showed around the window curtains. Actually, as I discovered when I turned on my bedside lamp, it was half-past two, the same hour that I had chosen for my sortie two nights before. The smell seemed to be growing fainter, and I wondered if it could be an illusion, an effect of auto-suggestion. I opened the door and put my head into the passage, and as quickly withdrew it, not only because the smell was stronger there, but for another reason, the passage was not in darkness as it had been the other night, for the hall lights had been turned on. Well, let Victor see to it, I thought. Whatever it is, no doubt he's on the prowl. Let this be his glory. But curiosity overcame me, and I changed my mind. In the hall, the smell was stronger. It seemed to come in waves. But where did it come from? My steps took me to the library. The door was open. A flickering light came through, and a smell strong enough to make my throat smart and my eyes water. I lingered putting off the moment of going in. Then I remembered the fire buckets in the hall and ran back for one. The water had a thick film of dust over it, and I had an irrational feeling that it would be less effective so, and that I ought to change it. I did not do so, however, but hurried back and somehow forced myself to go into the room. There were shadows, of course, and there was smoke drifting about as smoke does. The two together made a shape that is almost opaque, 
and the shape was opaque that I saw before I saw anything else, a shape that seemed to rise from its knees beside the fireplace and glide slantwise across my vision towards the inner wall of the library. I might not have noticed it so particularly had it not recalled to me the shape of the latecomer in my dream. Before I could ask myself what it was or meant, it had disappeared, chased perhaps from my attention by the obligation to act. The dark mass of the big round library table was between me and the fireplace. Beyond it should have been the card table, but that I could not see, except on the hearth no flames were visible. Relief struggling with misgiving, I turned the light on and advanced towards the fireplace, but I stopped halfway, for lying in front of it, beside the overturned card table, lay a body. Victor's. He was lying face downwards, curiously humped like a snail, under his brown Jaeger dressing gown, which covered him and the floor around him. And it was from his dressing gown, which was smouldering in patches and stuck all over with playing cards, some of which were also alight, that the smell of burning came. Yes, and from Victor himself, for when I tried to lift him up, I found beneath him a half-charred log, a couple of feet long, which the pressure of his body had almost extinguished, but not quite, and from which I could not at once release him, so deeply had it burned into his flesh. But the Persian carpet, being on the unburnt underside of the log, was hardly scorched. Afterwards, the explanation given was that the log had toppled off the fireplace and rolled onto the carpet, and Victor, coming down on a tour of inspection, had tripped up over it and died of shock before being burned. The evidence of shock was very strong, the doctor said. I don't know whether Nesta believed this. Shortly afterwards, she sold the house. I have since come to believe it, but I didn't at the time. At the time, I believed that Victor had met his death defending the house against a fire-raising intruder who, though defeated in his main object, had got the better of Victor in some peculiarly horrible way. For, though one of Victor's felt slippers had caught fire and was nearly burned through, the other was intact, while the footprints leading to the wall, though they were fainter than they had been the other time, both showed the mark of a great toe. I pointed this out to the police, who shrugged their shoulders, he might have taken his slippers off and put them on again, they said. One thing was certain. Victor had literally embraced his neurosis, and by doing so, had rid himself of it forever. Thirteen at Table by Lord Dunsany In front of a spacious fireplace of the old kind, when the logs were well alight, and men with pipes and glasses were gathered before it in great easeful chairs, and the wild weather outside, and the comfort that was within, and the season of the year, for it was Christmas, and the hour of the night, all called for the weird or uncanny. Then out spoke the ex-master of foxhounds, and told this tale. It was when I had the Bromley and Sydenham, the year I gave them up, as a matter of fact, it was the last day of the season. It was no use going on because there were no foxes left in the county and London was sweeping down on us. You could see it from the kennels all along the skyline like a terrible army in grey. And masses of villas every year came skirmishing down our valleys. Our coverts were mostly on the hills. And as the town came down upon the valleys, the foxes used to leave them and go right away out of the county. And they never returned. I think they went by night and moved great distances. Well, it was early April, and we had drawn a blank all day, and at the last draw of all, at the very last of the season, we found a fox. He left the covert with his back to London and its railways and villas and wire, and slipped away towards the chalk country and open Kent. I felt as I once felt as a child on one summer's day when I found a door in a garden where I played left luckily ajar and I pushed it open and wide lands were before me, and waving fields of corn. We settled down into a steady gallop, and the fields began to drift by under us, and a great wind arose full of fresh breath. We left the clay lands where the bracken grows and came to a valley at the edge of the chalk. As we went down into it, 
we saw the fox go up the other side like a shadow that crosses the evening and glide into a wood that stood on the top. We saw a flash of primroses in the wood, and we were out the other side, hounds hunting perfectly, and the fox still going absolutely straight. It began to dawn on me then that we were in for a great hunt. I took a deep breath when I thought of it, the taste of the air of that perfect spring afternoon as it came to one galloping, and the thought of a great run were together like some old rare wine. Our faces now were to another valley. Large fields led down to it with easy hedges. At the bottom of it a bright blue stream went singing and a rambling village smoked. The sunlight on the opposite slopes danced like a fairy. And all along the top old woods were frowning, but they dreamed of spring. The field had fallen off and were far behind, and my only human companion was James, my old first whip, who had a hound's instinct and a personal animosity against a fox that even embittered his speech. Across the valley, the fox went as straight as a railway line, and again we went without check straight through the woods at the top. I remember hearing men sing or shout as they walked home from work, and sometimes children whistled. The sounds came up from the village to the woods at the top of the valley. After that, we saw no more villages, but valley after valley arose and fell before us, as though we were voyaging some strange and stormy sea. And all the way before us, the fox went dead upwind like the fabulous flying Dutchman. There was no one in sight now but my first whip and me. We had both of us got on to our second horses as we drew the last covert. Two or three times we checked in those great lonely valleys beyond the village. But I began to have inspirations. I felt a strange certainty within me that this fox was going on straight upwind till he died, or until night came and we could hunt no longer. So I reversed ordinary methods and only cast straight ahead, and always we picked up the scent again at once. I believe that this fox was the last one left in the villa-haunted lands, and that he was prepared to leave them for remote uplands far from men, that if we had come the following day, he would not have been there, and that we just happened to hit off his journey. Evening began to descend upon the valleys, still the hounds drifted on, like the lazy but unresting shadows of clouds upon a summer's day. We heard a shepherd calling to his dog. We saw two maidens move towards a hidden farm, one of them singing softly. No other sounds but ours disturbed the leisure and the loneliness of haunts that seemed not yet to have known the inventions of steam and gunpowder. Even as China, they say, in some of her further mountains does not yet know that she has fought Japan. And now the day and our horses were wearing out, but that resolute fox held on. I began to work out the run and wonder where we were. The last landmark I had ever seen before must have been over five miles back, and from there to the start was at least ten miles more. If only we could kill. Then the sun set. I wondered what chance we had of killing our fox. I looked at James's face as he rode beside me. He did not seem to have lost any confidence, yet his horse was as tired as mine. It was a good, clear twilight, and the scent was as strong as ever, and the fences were easy enough, but those valleys were terribly trying, and they still rolled on and on. It looked as if the light would at last all possible endurance both of the fox and the horses, if the scent held good, and he did not go to ground, otherwise night would end it. For long we had seen no houses and no roads, only chalk slopes with a twilight on them, and here and there some sheep and scattered copses darkening in the evening. At some moment I seemed to realise all at once that the light was spent and the darkness was hovering. I looked at James. He was solemnly shaking his head. Suddenly, in a little wooded valley, we saw climb over the oaks the red-brown gables of a queer old house. At that instant... I saw the fox scarcely heading by fifty yards. We blundered through a wood in full sight of the house, but no avenue led up to it or even a path, nor were there any signs of wheel marks anywhere. Already lights shone here and there in windows. We were in a park, and a fine park, but unkempt beyond credibility. Brambles grew everywhere. It was too dark to see the fox any more, but we knew he was dead beat, the hounds were just before us, and a four-foot railing of oak. I shouldn't have tried it on a fresh horse at the beginning of a run, and here was a horse near his last gasp. 
but what a run! An event standing out in a lifetime, and the hounds close up on their fox slipping into the darkness as I hesitated. I decided to try it. My horse rose about eight inches and took it fair with his breast, and the oak log flew into handfuls of wet decay, it rotten with years. And then we were on a lawn, and at the far end of it the hounds were tumbling over their fox. Fox, hounds and light were all done together, at the end of a twenty-mile point. We made some noise then, but nobody came out of the queer old house. I felt pretty stiff as I walked round to the hall door with the mask and the brush while James went with the hounds and the two horses to look for the stables. I rang a bell marvellously encrusted with rust, and after a long while the door opened a little way, revealing a hall with much old armour in it and the shabbiest butler that I had ever known. I asked him who lived there. Sir Richard Arlen. I explained that my horse could go no further that night, and that I wished to ask Sir Richard Arlen for a bed for the night. Oh, no one ever comes here, sir, said the butler. I pointed out that I had come. I, I don't think it would be possible, sir, he said. This annoyed me, and I asked to see Sir Richard, and insisted until he came. Then I apologised and explained the situation. He looked only fifty, but a varsity oar on the wall with the date of the early seventies made him older than that. His face had something of the shy look of the hermit. He regretted that he had not room to put me up. I was sure that this was untrue. Also, I had to be put up there. There was nowhere else within miles, so I almost insisted. Then, to my astonishment, he turned to the butler and they talked it over in an undertone. At last they seemed to think that they could manage it, though clearly with reluctance. It was by now seven o'clock, and Sir Richard told me he dined at half-past seven. There was no question of clothes for me other than those I stood in, as my host was shorter and broader. He showed me presently to the drawing-room, and there he reappeared before half-past seven in evening dress and a white waistcoat. The drawing-room was large and contained old furniture, but it was rather worn than venerable. An Aubusson carpet flapped about the floor. The wind seemed momently to enter the room, and old draughts haunted corners. The stealthy feet of rats that were never at rest indicated the extent of the ruin that time had wrought in the wainscot. Somewhere far off a shutter flapped to and fro. The guttering candles were insufficient to light so large a room. The gloom that these things suggested was quite in keeping with Sir Richard's first remark to me after he entered the room. I must tell you, sir, that I have led a wicked life. Oh, a very wicked life. Such confidences from a man much older than oneself after one has known him for half an hour are so rare that any possible answer merely does not suggest itself. I said rather slowly, Oh, really? And chiefly to forestall another such remark, I said, What a charming house you have. Yes, he said. I have not left it for nearly forty years, since I left the varsity. One is young there, you know, and one has opportunities, but I make no excuses. No excuses. And the door slipping its rusty latch came drifting on the draught into the room, and the long carpet flapped and the hangings upon the walls. Then the draught fell rustling away, and the door slammed to again. Ah, Marianne, he said, we have a guest tonight, Mr. Linton. This is Marion Gibb. And everything became clear to me. Mad, I said to myself, for no one had entered the room. The rats ran up the length of the room behind the wainscot ceaselessly, and the wind unlatched the door again, and the folds of the carpet fluttered up to our feet and stopped there, for our weight held it down. Let me introduce Mr. Linton, said my host, Lady Mary Erinya. The door slammed back again. I bowed politely. Even had I been invited, I should have humoured him, but it was the very least that an uninvited guest could do. This kind of thing happened eleven times, the rustling and the fluttering of the carpet and the footsteps of the rats and the restless door, and then the sad voice of my host introducing me to phantoms. Then, for some while, we waited while I struggled with the situation. Conversation flowed slowly, and again the draught came trailing up the room, while the flaring candles filled it with hurrying shadows. "'Ah, late again, Sicily,' said my host in his soft, mournful way. "'Always late, Sicily.' Then I went down to dinner with that man and his mind, and the twelve phantoms that haunted it. 
I found a long table with fine old silver on it and places laid for fourteen. The butler was now sitting in evening dress. There were fewer draughts in the dining room. The scene was less gloomy here. "'Will you sit next to Rosalind at the other end?' Richard said to me. "'She always takes the head of the table.' I wronged her most of all. I said, "'I shall be delighted.' I looked at the butler closely, but never did I see by any expression of his face or by anything that he did any suggestion that he waited upon less than fourteen people in the complete possession of all their faculties. Perhaps a dish appeared to be refused more often than taken, but every glass was equally filled with champagne. At first I found little to say, but when Sir Richard, speaking from the far end of the table, said, "'You're tired, Mr. Linton,' I was reminded that I owed something to a host upon whom I had forced myself. It was excellent champagne, and with the help of a second glass, I made the effort to begin a conversation with a Miss Helen Herald, for whom the place upon one side of me was laid. It came more easy to me very soon. I frequently paused in my monologue like Mark Antony for a reply, and sometimes I turned and spoke to Miss Rosalind Smith. Sir Richard, at the other end, talked sorrowfully on, he spoke as a condemned man might speak to his judge, and yet somewhat as a judge might speak to one that he once condemned wrongly. My own mind began to turn to mournful things. I drank another glass of champagne, but I was still thirsty. I felt as if all the moisture in my body had been blown away over the downs of Kent by the wind-up which we had galloped. Still, I was not talking enough. My host was looking at me. I made another effort. After all, I had something to talk about. A twenty-mile point is not often seen in a lifetime, especially south of the Thames. I began to describe the run to Rosalind Smith. I could see then that my host was pleased. The sad look in his face gave a kind of flicker, like mist upon the mountains on a miserable day when a faint puff comes from the sea and the mist would lift if it could. And the butler refilled my glass very attentively. I asked her first if she hunted and paused and began my story. I told her where we had found the fox and how fast and straight he had gone, and how I had got through the village by keeping to the road while the little gardens and wire, and then the river had stopped the rest of the field. I told her the kind of country that we had crossed and how splendid it looked in the spring, and how mysterious the valleys were as soon as the twilight came, and what a glorious horse I had and how wonderfully he went. I was so fearfully thirsty after the great hunt that I had to stop for a moment now and again. But I went on with my description of that famous run, for I had warmed to the subject, and after all, there was nobody to tell of it but me except my old whipper in, and the old fellow's probably drunk by now, I thought. I described to her minutely the exact spot in the run at which it had come to me clearly that this was going to be the greatest hunt in the whole of the history of Kent, Sometimes I forgot incidents that had happened, as one well may in a run of twenty miles, and then I had to fill in the gaps by inventing. I was pleased to be able to make the party go off well by means of my conversation, and besides that the lady to whom I was speaking was extremely pretty. I do not mean in a flesh-and-blood kind of way, but there were little shadowy lines about the chair beside me that hinted at an unusually graceful figure when Miss Rosalind Smith was alive and I began to perceive that what I first mistook for the smoke of guttering candles and the tablecloth waving in the draught was in reality an extremely animated company who listened, and not without interest, to my story of by far the greatest hunt that the world had ever known. Indeed, I told them that I would confidently go further and predict that never in the history of the world would there be such a run again. Only my throat was terribly dry, and then, as it seemed, they wanted to hear more about my horse. I had forgotten that I had come there on a horse, but when they reminded me, it all came back. They looked so charming, leaning over the table, intent upon what I said, that I told them everything they wanted to know. Everything was going so pleasantly, if only Sir Richard would cheer up. I heard his mournful voice every now and then. These were very pleasant people, if he would only take them the right way. I could understand that he regretted his past, but the early seventies seemed centuries away, and I felt sure that he misunderstood these ladies. They were not revengeful, as he seemed to suppose. I wanted to show him how cheerful they really were, and so I made a joke, and they all laughed at it, 
and then I chaffed them a bit, especially Rosalind, and nobody resented it in the very least. And still Sir Richard sat there with that unhappy look, like one that has ended weeping because it is vain and has not the consolation even of tears. We had been a long time there, and many of the candles had burned out, but there was light enough. I was glad to have an audience for my exploit, and being happy myself, I was determined Sir Richard should be. I made more jokes, and they still laughed good-naturedly. Some of the jokes were a little broad, perhaps, but no harm was meant. And then, I do not wish to excuse myself, but I had had a harder day than I had ever had before, and without knowing it, I must have been completely exhausted. In this state, champagne had found me, and what would have been harmless at any other time must somehow have got the better of me when quite tired out. Anyhow, I went too far. I made some joke, I cannot in the least remember what, that suddenly seemed to offend them. I felt all at once a commotion in the air. I looked up and saw that they had all risen from the table and were sweeping towards the door. I had not time to open it, but it blew open on a wind. I could scarcely see what Sir Richard was doing, because only two candles were left. I think the rest blew out when the lady suddenly rose. I sprang up to apologise, to assure them, and then fatigue overcame me, as it had overcome my horse at the last fence. I clutched at the table, but the cloth came away, and then I fell. The fall and the darkness on the floor and the pent-up fatigue of the day overcame me all three together. The sun shone over glittering fields, and in at a bedroom window, and thousands of birds were chanting to the spring. And there I was, in an old four-poster bed, in a quaint old panelled bedroom, fully dressed and wearing long, muddy boots. Someone had taken my spurs, and that was all. For a moment I failed to realise, and then it all came back. My enormity, and the pressing need of an abject apology to Sir Richard. I pulled an embroidered bell-rope until the butler came. He came in perfectly cheerful and indescribably shabby. I asked him if Sir Richard was up, and he said he had just gone down, and told me to my amazement that it was twelve o'clock. I asked to be shown in to Sir Richard at once. He was in his smoking room. "'Good morning,' he said rather cheerfully, the moment I went in. I went directly to the matter in hand. "'I fear that I insulted some ladies in your house,' I began. "'You did indeed,' he said. "'You did indeed.' and then he burst into tears and took me by the hand. "'How can I ever thank you?' he said to me then. "'We have been thirteen at table for thirty years, and I never dared to insult them, because I had wronged them all. And now you have done it, and I know they will never dine here again.' And for a long time he still held my hand, and then he gave it a grip and a kind of a shake, which I took to mean goodbye. And I drew my hand away then, and left the house, and I found James in the stables with the hounds and asked him how he had fared, and James, who was a man of very few words, said he could not rightly remember. And I got my spurs from the butler and climbed onto my horse, and slowly we rode away from that queer old house, and slowly we wended home, for the hounds were footsore but happy, and the horses were tired still. And when we recalled that the hunting season was ended, we turned our faces to spring, and thought of new things that tried to replace the old. And that very year I heard, and have often heard since, of dances and happier dinners at Sir Richard Arlen's house. How Fear Departed the Long Gallery by E. F. Benson Church Peveril is a house so beset and frequented by spectres, both visible and audible, that none of the family which it shelters under its acre and a half of green copper roofs take psychical phenomena with any seriousness, for to the Peverils the appearance of a ghost is a matter of hardly greater significance than is the appearance of the post to those who live in more ordinary houses. It arrives, that is to say, practically every day. It knocks, or makes other noises. It is observed coming up the drive, or in other places. I myself, when staying there, have seen the present Mrs. Peveril, who was rather short-sighted, peer into the dusk while we were taking our coffee on the terrace after dinner, and say to her daughter, My dear, was not that the blue lady who has just gone into the shrubbery? I hope she won't frighten Flo. Whistle for Flo, dear. Flo, it may be remarked, is the youngest and most precious of many Dachshunds. Blanche Peveril gave a cursory whistle and crunched the sugar left unmelted at the bottom of her coffee cup 
between her very white teeth. Oh, darling, Flo isn't so silly as to mind, she said. Poor blue Aunt Barbara is such a bore. Whenever I meet her, she always looks as if she wanted to speak to me. But when I say, what is it, Aunt Barbara? She never utters, but only points somewhere towards the house, which is so vague. I believe there was something she wanted to confess about two hundred years ago, but she has forgotten what it is. Here Flo gave two or three short, pleased barks and came out of the shrubbery, wagging her tail and capering round what appeared to me to be a perfectly empty space on the lawn. There, Flo has made friends with her, said Mrs. Peveril. I wonder why she dresses in that very stupid shade of blue. From this it may be gathered that even with regard to psychical phenomena, there is some truth in the proverb that speaks of familiarity. But the Peverils do not exactly treat their ghosts with contempt, since most of that delightful family never despised anybody except such people as avowedly did not care for hunting or shooting, or golf or skating. And as all of their ghosts are of their family, it seems reasonable to suppose that they all, even the poor blue lady, excelled at one time in field sports. So far, then, they harbour no such unkindness or contempt, but only pity. Of one Peveril, indeed, who broke his neck in vainly attempting to ride up the main staircase on a thoroughbred mare after some monstrous and violent deed in the back garden, they are very fond and Blanche comes downstairs in the morning with an eye unusually bright when she can announce that Master Antony was very loud last night. He, apart from the fact of his being so foul a ruffian, was a tremendous fellow across country, and they like these indications of the continuance of his superb vitality. In fact, it is supposed to be a compliment when you go to stay at Church Peveril to be assigned a bedroom which is frequented by defunct members of the family. It means that you are worthy to look on the august and villainous dead, and you will find yourself shown into some vaulted or tapestried chamber, without benefit of electric light, and told that great-great-grandmama Bridget occasionally has vague business by the fireplace, but it is better not to talk to her, and that you will hear Master Antony awfully well if he attempts the front staircase at any time before morning. There you are, left for your night's repose, and having quakingly undressed to begin reluctantly to put out your candles. It is draughty in these great chambers, and the solemn tapestry swings and bellows and subsides, and the firelight dances on the forms of huntsmen and warriors and stern pursuits. Then you climb into your bed, a bed so huge that you feel as if the desert of Sahara were spread for you, and pray like the mariners who sailed with St. Paul for day. And all the time you are aware that Freddy and Harry and Blanche and possibly even Mrs. Peveril are quite capable of dressing up and making disquieting tappings outside your door, so that when you open it some inconjecturable horror fronts you. For myself, I stick steadily to the assertion that I have an obscure valvular disease of the heart and so sleep undisturbed in the new wing of the house where Aunt Barbara and great-great-grandmama Bridget and Master Antony never penetrate. I forget the details of great-great-grandmama Bridget, but she certainly cut the throat of some distant relation before she disemboweled herself with the axe that had been used at Agincourt. Before that, she had led a very sultry life, crammed with amazing incident. But there is one ghost at Church Peveril at which the family never laugh in which they feel no friendly and amused interest, and of which they only speak just as much as is necessary for the safety of their guests. More properly, it should be described as two ghosts, for the haunt in question is that of two very young children who were twins. These, not without reason, the family take very seriously indeed. The story of them is told me by Mrs. Peveril, is as follows. In the year 1602, the same being the last of Queen Elizabeth's reign, a certain Dick Peveril was greatly in favour at court. He was brother to Master Joseph Peveril, then owner of the family house and lands, who two years previously, at the respectable age of seventy-four, became father of twin boys, first born of his progeny. It is known that the royal and ancient virgin had said to handsome Dick, who was nearly forty years his brother's junior, "'Tis pity that you're not master of Church Peveril. 
and these words probably suggested to him a sinister design. Be that as it may, Handsome Dick, who very adequately sustained the family reputation for wickedness, set off to ride down to Yorkshire, and found that very conveniently his brother Joseph had just been seized with an apoplexy, which appeared to be the result of a continued spell of hot weather combined with the necessity of quenching his thirst with an augmented amount of sack, and had actually died, while handsome Dick, with God knows what thoughts in his mind, was journeying northwards. Thus it came about that he arrived at Church Peveril just in time for his brother's funeral. It was with great propriety that he attended the obsequies, and returned to spend a sympathetic day or two of mourning with his widowed sister-in-law, who was but a faint-hearted dame little fit to be mated with such hawks as these. On the second night of his stay, he did that which the Peverils regret to this day. He entered the room where the twins slept with their nurse, and quietly strangled the latter as she slept. Then he took the twins and put them into the fire which warms the long gallery. The weather, which up to the day of Joseph's death had been so hot, had changed suddenly to bitter cold, and the fire was heaped high with burning logs and was exultant with flame. In the core of this conflagration he stuck out a cremation chamber, and into that he threw the two children, stamping them down with his riding boots. They could just walk, but they could not walk out of that ardent place. It is said that he laughed as he added more logs. Thus he became master of Church Peveril. The crime was never brought home to him, but he lived no longer than a year in the enjoyment of his blood-stained inheritance. When he lay a-dying, he made his confession to the priest who attended him, but his spirit struggled forth from its fleshly coil before absolution could be given him. On that very night there began in Church Peveril the haunting to which this day is but seldom spoken of by the family, and then only in low tones and with serious mien. For only an hour or two after handsome Dick's death, one of the servants passing the door of the long gallery heard from within peals of the loud laughter, so jovial and yet so sinister, which he had thought would never be heard in the house again. In a moment of that cold courage which is so nearly akin to mortal terror, he opened the door and entered, expecting to see he knew not what manifestation of him who lay dead in the room below. Instead he saw two little white-robed figures toddling towards him hand in hand across the moonlit floor. The watchers in the room below ran upstairs startled by the crash of his fallen body and found him lying in the grip of some dread convulsion. Just before morning he regained consciousness and told his tale. Then, pointing with trembling at ash-grey finger towards the door, he screamed aloud and so fell back dead. During the next fifty years this strange and terrible legend of the twin babies became fixed and consolidated. Their appearance, luckily for those who inhabit the house, was exceedingly rare, and during these years they seem to have been seen four or five times only. On each occasion they appeared at night, between sunset and sunrise, always in the same long gallery and always as two toddling children scarcely able to walk, and on each occasion the luckless individual who saw them died either speedily or terribly, or with both speed and terror, after the accursed vision had appeared to him. Sometimes he might live for a few months. He was lucky if he died, as did the servant who first saw them in a few hours, Vastly more awful was the fate of a certain Mrs. Canning, who had the ill luck to see them in the middle of the next century, or to be quite accurate, in the year 1760. By this time the hours and the place of their appearance were well known, and as up till a year ago visitors were warned not to go between sunset and sunrise into the long gallery. But Mrs. Canning, a brilliantly clever and beautiful woman, admirer also and friend of the notorious sceptic Monsieur Voltaire, Wilfully went and sat night after night, in spite of all protestations, in the haunted place. For four evenings she saw nothing, but on the fifth she had her will, for the door in the middle of the gallery opened, and there came toddling towards her the ill-omened, innocent little pair. It seemed that even then she was not frightened, but she thought it good, poor wretch, to mock at them, 
telling them that it was time for them to get back into the fire. They gave no word in answer, but turned away from her crying and sobbing. Immediately after, they disappeared from her vision, and she rustled downstairs to where the family and guests in the house were waiting for her, with the triumphant announcement that she had seen them both, and must needs write to Monsieur Voltaire, saying that she had spoken to spirits made manifest. It would make him laugh. But when some months later the whole news reached him, he did not laugh at all. Mrs. Canning was one of the great beauties of her day, and in the year 1760 she was at the height and zenith of her blossoming. The chief beauty, if it is possible to single out one point where all were so exquisite, lay in the dazzling colour and incomparable brilliance of her complexion. She was now just thirty years of age, but in spite of the excesses of her life, retained the snow and roses of girlhood and she courted the bright light of day which other women shunned, for it but showed to great advantage the splendour of her skin. In consequence, she was very considerably dismayed one morning, about a fortnight after her strange experience in the long gallery, to observe on her left cheek, an inch or two below her turquoise-coloured eyes, a little greyish patch of skin, about as big as a threepenny piece. It was in vain that she applied her accustomed washes and unguents. Vain, too, were the arts of her fadeurs and of her medical adviser. For a week she kept herself secluded, martyring herself with solitude and unaccustomed physics, and for result at the end of the week she had no amelioration to comfort herself with. Instead, this woeful grey patch had doubled itself in size. Thereafter the nameless disease, whatever it was, developed in new and terrible ways. From the centre of the discoloured place there sprouted forth little lichen-like tendrils of greenish-grey, and another patch appeared on her lower lip. This too soon vegetated, and one morning, on opening her eyes to the horror of a new day, she found that her vision was strangely blurred. She sprang to her looking-glass, and what she saw caused her to shriek aloud with horror, from under her upper eyelid a fresh growth had sprung up, mushroom-like, in the night, and its filaments extended downwards, screening the pupil of her eye. Soon after, her tongue and throat were attacked. The air passages became obstructed, and death by suffocation was merciful after such suffering. More terrible yet was the case of a certain Colonel Blantyre, who fired at the children with his revolver. What he went through is not to be recorded here. It is this haunting, then, that the Peverils take quite seriously, and every guest on his arrival in the house is told that the long gallery must not be entered after nightfall on any pretext whatever. By day, however, it is a delightful room, and intrinsically merits description, apart from the fact that the due understanding of its geography is necessary for the account that here follows. It is full eighty feet in length, and is lit by a row of six tall windows looking over the gardens at the back of the house. A door communicates with the landing at the top of the main staircase, and about halfway down the gallery in the wall facing the windows is another door communicating with the back staircase and servants' quarters, and thus the gallery forms a constant place of passage for them in going to the rooms on the first landing. It was through this door that the baby figures came when they appeared to Mrs. Canning, and on several other occasions they have been known to make their entry here, for the room out of which handsome Dick took them lies just beyond at the top of the back stairs. Further on again in the gallery is the fireplace into which he thrust them, and at the far end a large bow window looks straight down the avenue. Above this fireplace there hangs with grim significance a portrait of handsome Dick in the insolent beauty of early manhood attributed to Holbein, and a dozen other portraits of great merit face the windows. During the day this is the most frequented sitting-room in the house, for its other visitors never appear there then, nor does it then ever resound with the harsh jovial laugh of handsome Dick, which sometimes, after dark has fallen, is heard by passers-by on the landing outside. But Blanche does not grow bright-eyed when she hears it, she shuts her ears and hastens to put a greater distance between her and the sound of that atrocious mirth. 
but during the day, the long gallery is frequented by many occupants, and much laughter in no wise sinister or saturnine resounds there. When summer lies hot over the land, those occupants lounge in the deep window seats, and when winter spreads his icy fingers and blows shrilly between his frozen palms, congregate round the fireplace at the far end, and perch in companies of cheerful chatterers upon sofa and chair, and chair back and floor. Often have I sat there on long August evenings up till dressing time, but never have I been there when anyone has seemed disposed to linger over late without hearing the warning, It's close on sunset. Shall we go? Later on in the shorter autumn days they often have tea laid there, and sometimes it has happened that even while merriment was most uproarious, Mrs. Peveril has suddenly looked out of the window and said, My dears, it is getting so late. Let us finish our nonsense downstairs in the hall. And then for a moment, a curious hush always falls on loquacious family and guests alike. And as if some bad news had just been known, we all make our silent way out of the place. But the spirits of the Peverils, of the living ones, that is to say, are the most mercurial imaginable, and the blight which the thought of handsome Dick and his doings casts over them passes away again with amazing rapidity. A typical party, large, young, and peculiarly cheerful, was staying at Church Peveril shortly after Christmas last year, and as usual on December the 31st, Mrs. Peveril was giving her annual New Year's Eve ball. The house was quite full, and she had commandeered as well the greater part of the Peveril Arms to provide sleeping quarters for the overflow from the house. For some days past, a black and windless frost had stopped all hunting. But it is an ill windlessness that blows no good, if so mixed a metaphor may be forgiven, and the lake below the house had for the last day or two been covered with an adequate and admirable sheet of ice. Everyone in the house had been occupied all the morning of that day in performing swift and violent manoeuvres on the elusive surface, and as soon as lunch was over we all, with one exception, hurried out again. This one exception was Madge Dalrymple, who had had the misfortune to fall rather badly earlier in the day, but hoped by resting her injured knee instead of joining the skaters again to be able to dance that evening. The hope, it is true, was the most sanguine sort, for she could but hobble innobly back to the house. But with the breezy optimism which characterises the Peverils, she is Blanche's first cousin, she remarked that it would be but tepid enjoyment that she could in her present state derive from further skating, and thus she sacrificed little, but might gain much. Accordingly, after a rapid cup of coffee which was served in the long gallery, we left Madge comfortably reclined on the big sofa at right angles to the fireplace, with an attractive book to beguile the tedium till tea. Being of the family, she knew all about handsome Dick and the babies, and the fate of Mrs. Canning and Colonel Blantyre. But as we went out, I heard Blanche say to her, don't run it too fine, dear. And Madge had replied, No, I'll go away well before sunset. And so we left her all alone in a long gallery. Madge read her attractive book for some minutes, but failing to get absorbed in it, put it down and limped across to the window. Though it was still but a little after two, it was but a dim and uncertain light that entered, for the crystalline brightness of the morning had given place to a veiled obscurity produced by flocks of thick clouds which were coming sluggishly up from the northeast. Already the whole sky was overcast with them, and occasionally a few snowflakes fluttered waveringly down past the long windows. From the darkness and bitter cold of the afternoon, it seemed to her that there was like to be a heavy snowfall before long, and these outward signs were echoed inwardly in her by the muffled drowsiness of the brain, which to those who are sensitive to the pressures and lightness of weather portends storm. Madge was peculiarly the prey of such external influences. To her a brisk morning gave an ineffable brightness and briskness of spirit, and correspondingly the approach of heavy weather produced a somnolescence in sensation that both drowsed and depressed her. It was in such a mood as this that she limped back again to the sofa beside the log fire. The whole house was comfortably heated by water pipes, and though the fire of logs and peat, an adorable mixture, 
had been allowed to burn low, the room was very warm. Idly she watched the dwindling flames, not opening her book again, but lying on the sofa with face towards the fireplace, intending drowsily and not immediately to go to her own room and spend the hours until the return of the skaters made gaiety in the house again, in writing one or two neglected letters. Still drowsily, she began thinking over what she had to communicate. One letter, several days overdue, should go to her mother, who was immensely interested in the psychical affairs of the family. She would tell her how Master Anthony had been prodigiously active on the staircase a night or two ago, and how the Blue Lady, regardless of the severity of the weather, had been seen by Mrs. Peveril that morning strolling about. It was rather interesting. The Blue Lady had gone down the laurel walk and had been seen by her to enter the stables where, at the moment, Freddy Peveril was inspecting the frostbound hunters. Identically, then, a sudden panic had spread through the stables and the horses had whinnied and kicked and shied and sweated. Of the fatal twins, nothing had been seen for many years past, but as her mother knew, the Peverils never used the long gallery after dark. Then, for a moment, she sat up, remembering that she was in the long gallery now. But it was still but a little after half past two, and if she went to her room in half an hour, she would have ample time to write this and another letter before tea. Till then, she would read her book, but she found she had left it on the window sill, and it seemed scarcely worth while to get it. She felt exceedingly drowsy. The sofa where she lay had been lately recovered in a greyish-green shade of velvet, somewhat the colour of lichen. It was of a very thick, soft texture, and she luxuriously stretched her arms out, one on each side of her body, and pressed her fingers into the nap. How horrible that story of Mrs. Canning was! The growth on her face was of the colour of lichen. And then... Without further transition or blurring of thought, Madge fell asleep. She dreamed. She dreamed that she awoke and found herself exactly where she had gone to sleep, and in exactly the same attitude. The flames from the logs had burned up again and leaped on the walls, fitfully illuminating the picture of handsome Dick above the fireplace. In her dream she knew exactly what she had done today, and for what reason she was lying here now instead of being out with the rest of the skaters. She remembered also, still dreaming, that she was going to write a letter or two before tea and prepared to get up in order to go to her room. As she half rose, she caught sight of her own arms lying out on each side of her on the grey velvet sofa, but she couldn't see where her hands ended and where the green velvet began. Her fingers seemed to have melted into the stuff. She could see her wrists quite clearly and a blue vein on the backs of her hands, and here and there a knuckle. Then, in her dream, she remembered the last thought which had been in her mind before she fell asleep, namely the growth of the lichen-coloured vegetation on the face and the eyes and the throat of Mrs. Canning. And at that thought, the strangling terror of real nightmare began. She knew that she was being transformed into this grey stuff, and she was absolutely unable to move. Soon. The grey would spread up her arms and over her feet. When they came in from the skating, they would find here nothing but a huge misshapen cushion of lichen-coloured velvet, and that would be she. The horror grew more acute, and then by a violent effort she shook herself free of the clutches of this very evil dream, and she awoke. For a minute or two she lay there, conscious only of the tremendous relief at finding herself awake. She felt again with her fingers the pleasant touch of the velvet, and drew them backwards and forwards, assuring herself that she was not, as her dream had suggested, melting into greyness and softness. But she was still, in spite of the violence of her awakening, very sleepy, and lay there, till looking down, she was aware that she could not see her hands at all. It was very nearly dark. At that moment, a sudden flicker of flame came from the dying fire, and a flare of burning gas from the peat flooded the room. The portrait of handsome Dick looked evilly down on her, and her hands were visible again, and then a panic worse than the panic of her dreams seized her. Daylight had altogether faded, and she knew that she was alone.
in the dark, in the terrible gallery. This panic was of the nature of nightmare, for she felt unable to move for terror, and it was worse than nightmare because she knew she was awake. And then the full cause of this frozen fear dawned on her. She knew with the certainty of absolute conviction that she was about to see the twin babies. She felt a sudden moisture break out on her face, and within her mouth her tongue and throat went suddenly dry, and she felt her tongue grate along the inner surface of her teeth. All power of movement had slipped from her limbs, leaving them dead and inert, and she stared with wide eyes into the blackness. The spurt of flame from the peat had burned itself out again, and darkness encompassed her. Then, on the wall opposite her, facing the windows, there grew a faint light of dusky crimson. For a moment she thought it but heralded the approach of the awful vision. Then hope revived in her heart, and she remembered that thick clouds had overcast the sky before she went to sleep, and guessed that this light came from the sun, not quite sunk and set. This sudden revival of hope gave her the necessary stimulus and she sprang off the sofa where she lay. She looked out of the window and saw the dull glow on the horizon, but before she could take a step forward it was obscured again. A tiny sparkle of light came from the hearth which did no more than illuminate the tiles of the fireplace, and snow falling heavily tapped at the window panes. There was neither light nor sound except these, but the courage that had come to her giving her the power of movement had not quite deserted her and she began feeling her way down the gallery, and then she found that she was lost. She stumbled against a chair, and recovering herself, stumbled against another. Then a table barred her way, and turning swiftly aside, she found herself up against the back of a sofa. Once more she turned and saw the dim gleam of the firelight on the side opposite to that on which she expected it. In her blind groping she must have reversed her direction. But which way was she to go now? She seemed blocked in by furniture, and all the time insistent and imminent was the fact that the two innocent, terrible ghosts were about to appear to her. Then she began to pray. Lighten our darkness, O Lord, she said to herself. But she could not remember how the prayer continued, and she had sore need of it. There was something about the perils of the night. All this time she felt about her with groping, fluttering hands. The fire glimmer which should have been on her left was on her right again. Therefore she must turn herself around again. Light in our darkness, she whispered. And then aloud she repeated, Light in our darkness. She stumbled up against the screen and could not remember the existence of any such screen. Hastily she felt beside it with blind hands and touched something soft and velvety. Was it the sofa on which she had lain? If so, where was the head of it? It had a head and back and feet. It was like a person, all covered with grey lichen. Then she lost her head completely. All that remained to her was to pray. She was lost, lost in this awful place where no one came in the dark except the babies that cried. And she heard her voice rising from whisper to speech and speech to scream. She shrieked out the holy words. She yelled them as if blaspheming as she groped among tables and chairs and the pleasant things of ordinary life which had become so terrible. Then came a sudden and an awful answer to her screamed prayer. Once more a pocket of inflammable gas in the peat on the hearth was reached by the smouldering embers, and the room started into light. She saw the evil eyes of handsome Dick. She saw the little ghostly snowflakes falling thickly outside and she saw where she was, just opposite the door through which the terrible twins made their entrance. Then the flame went out again, and left her in blackness once more. But she had gained something, for she had her geography now. The centre of the room was bare of furniture, and one swift dart would take her to the door of the landing above the main staircase, and into safety. In that gleam she had been able to see the handle of the door, bright brass, luminous like a star. She would go straight for it. It was but a matter of a few seconds now. 
She took a long breath, partly of relief, partly to satisfy the demands of her galloping heart. But the breath was only half taken when she was stricken once more into the immobility of nightmare. There came a little whisper. It was no more than that. From the door opposite which she stood, and through which the twin babies entered. It was not quite dark outside it, but she could see that the door was opening, and there stood in the opening two little white figures side by side. They came towards her slowly, shufflingly. She couldn't see face or form at all distinctly, but the two little white figures were advancing, she knew them to be the ghosts of terror, innocent of the awful doom they were bound to bring, even as she was innocent. With the inconceivable rapidity of thought, she made up her mind what to do. She had not hurt them or laughed at them, and they, they were but babies when the wicked and bloody deed had sent them to their burning death. Surely the spirits of these children would not be inaccessible to the cry of one who was of the same blood as they who had committed no fault that merited the doom they brought. If she entreated them, they might have mercy. They might forbear to bring the curse on her. They might allow her to pass out of the place without blight, without the sentence of death, or the shadow of things worse than death upon her. It was but for the space of a moment that she hesitated. Then she sank down onto her knees and stretched out her hands towards them. Oh, my dears, she said, I only fell asleep. I have done no more wrong than that. She paused a moment, and her tender girl's heart thought no more of herself, but only of them, those little innocent spirits on whom so awful a doom was laid that they should bring death where other children bring laughter and doom for delight. But all those who had seen them before had dreaded and feared them or had mocked at them. Then, as the enlightenment of pity dawned on her, her fear fell from her like the wrinkled sheath that holds the sweet folded buds of spring. Dears, I'm so sorry for you, she said. It isn't your fault that you must bring me what you must bring. But I'm not afraid any longer. I'm only sorry for you. God bless you, you poor darlings. She raised her head and looked at them. Though it was so dark, she could now see their faces, though all was dim and wavering, like the light of pale flame shaken by a draught. But the faces were not miserable or fierce. They smiled at her with shy little baby smiles. And as she looked, they grew faint, fading slowly away like wreaths of vapour in frosty air. Madge didn't at once move when they had vanished. For instead of fear, there was wrapped around her a wonderful sense of peace, so happy and serene that she wouldn't willingly stir and so perhaps disturb it. But before long she got up, and feeling her way, but without any sense of nightmare pressing her on, or frenzy of fear to spur her, she went out of the long gallery, to find Blanche just coming upstairs whistling and swinging her skates. "'How's the leg, dear?' she asked. "'You're not limping any more.' Till that moment, Madge had not thought of it. I, I think it must be all right, she said. I had forgotten it anyhow. Blanche, dear, you won't be frightened for me, will you? But, but, I've seen the twins. For a moment, Blanche's face whitened with terror. What? she said in a whisper. Yes, I saw them just now. But they were kind. They smiled at me, and I was so sorry for them. And somehow, I'm sure I have nothing to fear. It seems that Madge was right, for nothing has come to touch her. Something, her attitude to them, we must suppose, her pity, her sympathy, touched and dissolved and annihilated the curse. Indeed, I was at Church Peveril only last week, arriving there after dark. Just as I passed the gallery door, Blanche came out. Ah, there you are, she said. I've just been seeing the twins. They look too sweet and stopped nearly ten minutes. Let us have tea at once. The Red Lodge by H. R. Wakefield I am writing this from an imperative sense of duty. 
for I consider the Red Lodge is a foul death trap and utterly unfit to be a human habitation. It has its own proper denizens, and because I know its owner to be an unspeakable blackguard to allow it so to be used for his financial advantage. He knows the perils of the place perfectly well. I wrote him of our experiences, and he didn't even acknowledge the letter. And two days ago, I saw the ghastly pest house advertised in Country Life, so anyone who rents the Red Lodge in future will receive a copy of this document, as well as some uncomfortable words from Sir William, and that scoundrel Wilkes can take what action he pleases. I certainly didn't carry any prejudice against the place down to it with me. I had been too busy to look over it myself, but my wife reported extremely favourably. I take her word for most things, and I could tell by the photographs that it was a magnificent specimen of the medium-sized Queen Anne house, just the ideal thing for me. Mary said the garden was perfect, and there was the river for Tim at the bottom of it. I had been longing for a holiday, and was in the highest spirits as I travelled down. I was not in the highest spirits for long. My first vague uncertainty came to me as soon as I had crossed the threshold. I am a painter by profession, and therefore sharply responsive to colour tone. Well, it was a brilliantly fine day. The hall of the Red Lodge was fully lighted, yet it seemed a shade off the key, as it were, as though I were regarding it through a pair of slightly darkened glasses. Only a painter would have noticed it, I fancy. When Mary came out to greet me, she was not looking as well as I had hoped, or as well as a week in the country should have made her look. Everything all right? I asked. Oh, yes, she replied, but I thought she found it difficult to say so, and then my eye detected a curious little spot of green on the maroon rug in front of the fireplace. I picked it up. It seemed like a patch of river slime. Uh, I suppose Tim brings those in, said Mary. I found several. Of course he promises he doesn't. And then for a moment we were silent, and a very unusual sense of constraint seemed to set a barrier between us. I went out into the garden to smoke a cigarette before lunch, and sat myself down under a very fine mulberry tree. I wondered if, after all, I had been wise to have left it all to Mary. There was nothing wrong with the house, of course, but I am a bit psychic, and I always know the mood or character of a house. One welcomes you with the tail-writhing enthusiasm of a really nice dog, makes you at home and at your ease at once. Others are sullen, watchful, hostile, with things to hide. They make you feel that you have obtruded yourself into some curious affairs which are none of your business. I had never encountered so hostile, aloof, and secretive a living place as the Red Lodge seemed when I first entered it. Well, it couldn't be helped, though it was disappointing, and there was Tim coming back from his walk, and the luncheon gong. My son seemed a little subdued and thoughtful, though he looked pretty well, and soon we were all chattering away with those quick changes of key which occur when the respective ages of the conversationalists are forty, thirty-three, and six and one-half. And after half a bottle of Merceau and a glass of port, I began to think I had been a morbid ass. I was still so thinking when I began my holiday in the best possible way by going to sleep in an exquisitely comfortable chair under the mulberry tree but I have slept better. I dozed off, but I had a silly impression of being watched, so that I kept waking up in case there might be someone with his eye on me. I was lying back and could just see a window on the second floor framed by a gap in the leaves, and on one occasion, when I woke rather sharply from one of these dozes, I thought I saw for a moment a face peering down at me and this face seemed curiously flattened against the pane. Just a carryover from a dream, I concluded. However, I didn't feel like sleeping any more, and began to explore the garden. 
It was completely walled in, I found, except at the far end, where there was a door leading through to a path which, running parallel to the right-hand wall, led to the river a few yards away. I noticed on this door several of those patches of green slime for which Tim was supposedly responsible. It was a dark little corner, cut off from the rest of the garden by two rowan trees. A cool, silent little place, I thought it. And then it was time for Tim's cricket lesson, which was interrupted by the arrival of some infernal callers. But they were pleasant people, as a matter of fact. The local nuts, I gathered, who owned the manor house, Sir William Prowse and his lady and his daughter. I went for a walk with him after tea. Who had this house before us? I asked. People called Hawker, he replied. That was two years ago. I wonder the owner doesn't live in it, I said. It isn't an expensive place to keep up. Sir William paused, as if considering his reply. I, I think he dislikes being so near the river. I'm not sorry, for I detest the fellow. By the way, how long have you taken it for? Uh, three months, I replied, uh, till the end of October. Well, if I can do anything for you, uh, I shall be delighted. If you are in any trouble, come straight to me. He slightly emphasised the last sentence. I rather wondered what sort of trouble Sir William envisaged for me. Probably he shared the general opinion that artists were quite mad at times, and that when I had one of my lapses I should destroy the piece in some manner. However, I was duly grateful. I was sorry to find Tim didn't seem to like the river. He appeared nervous of it, and I determined to help him to overcome this, for the fewer terrors one carries through life with one, the better, and they can often be laid by a delicate treatment in childhood. Curiously enough, the year before at Frinton he seemed to have no fear of the sea. The rest of the day passed uneventfully, at least I think I can say so. After dinner I strolled down to the end of the garden, meaning to go through the door and have a look at the river. Just as I got my hand on the latch, there came a very sharp, furtive whistle. I turned round quickly, but, seeing no one, concluded it had come from someone in the lane outside. However, I didn't investigate further, but went back to the house. I woke up the next morning feeling a shade depressed. My dressing room smelled stale and bitter, and I flung its windows open. As I did so, I felt my right foot slip on something. It was one of those small, slimy green patches. Now Tim would never come into my dressing room. An annoying little puzzle. How on earth had that patch, which question kept forcing its way into my mind as I dressed, how could a patch of green slime, how could a patch of green slime drop from something? From what? I am very fond of my wife. She slaved for me when I was poor, and always has kept me happy, comfortable and faithful, and she gave me my small son Timothy. I must stand between her and patches of green slime. What in hell's name was I talking about? And it was a flaming fine day. Yet all during breakfast my mind was trying to find some sufficient reason for these funny little patches of green slime, and not finding it. After breakfast I told Tim I would take him out in a boat on the river. Must I, Daddy? he asked, looking anxiously at me. No, of course not, I replied a trifle irritably, but I believe you'll enjoy it. Should I be a funk if I didn't come? No, Tim, but but I think you should try it once, anyway. O all right, he said. He's a plucky little chap and did his very best to pretend to be enjoying himself, but I saw it was a failure from the start. Perplexed and upset, I asked his nurse if she knew of any reason for this sudden fear of water. No, sir, she said. The first day he ran down to the river just as he used to run down to the sea, but all of a sudden he started crying and ran back to the house. It seemed to me he'd seen something in the water which frightened him. We spent the afternoon motoring round the neighbourhood, and already I found a faint distaste at the idea of returning to the house, and again I had the impression that we were intruding, and that something had been going on during our absence which our return had interrupted. Mary, pleading a headache, went to bed soon after dinner, 
and I went to the study to read. Directly I had shut the door, I had again that very unpleasant sensation of being watched. It made the reading of Sidgwick's The Use of Words in Reasoning an old favourite of mine, which requires concentration, a difficult business. Time after time I found myself peeping into dark corners and shifting my position. And there were little sharp sounds, just the oak panelling cracking, I supposed. After a time I became more absorbed in the book and less fidgety, and then I heard a very soft cough just behind me. I felt little icy rays pour down and through me, but I would not look round, and I would go in reading. I had just reached the following passage. However many things may be said about Socrates, or about any fact observed, there remains still more that might be said if the need arose. The need is the determining factor, hence the distinction between complete and incomplete description, though perfectly sharp and clear in the abstract, can only have a meaning, can only be applied to actual cases, if it be taken as equivalent to sufficient description, the sufficiency being relative to some purpose. Evidently the description of Socrates as a man, scanty though it is, may be fully sufficient for the purpose of the modest inquiry whether he is mortal or not. When my eye was caught by a green patch, which suddenly appeared on the floor beside me, and then another, and another, following a straight line towards the door, I picked up the nearest one, and it was a bit of soaking slime. I called on all my willpower, for I feared something worse to come, and it should not materialise, and then no more patches appeared. I got up and walked deliberately, slowly to the door, turned on the light in the middle of the room, and then came back and turned out the reading lamp, and went to my dressing room. I sat down and thought things over. There was something very wrong with this house. I had passed the stage of pretending otherwise, and my inclination was to take my family away from it the next day. But that meant sacrificing £168, and we had nowhere else to go. It was conceivable that these phenomena were perceptible only to me, being half a Highlander. I might be able to stick it out if I were careful and kept my tail up, for apparitions of this sort are partially subjective. One brings something of oneself to their materialisation. That is a hard saying, but I believe it to be true. If Mary and Tim and the servants were immune, it was up to me to face and fight this nastiness. As I undressed, I came to the decision that I would decide nothing then and there, and that I would see what happened. I made this decision against my better judgment, I think. In bed I tried to thrust all this away from me by a conscious effort to change the subject, as it were. The easiest subject for me to switch over to is the myriad-sided, useless, consistently abused business of creating things, stories out of pens and ink and paper, representations of things and moods out of paint, brushes and canvas, and our own miseries, perhaps, out of wine, women and song. With a considerable effort, therefore, and with the edges of my brain anxious to be busy with bits of green slime, I recalled an article I had read that day on a glorious word, Jugendbewegung, the youth movement, that pregnant or merely wind-swollen Teutonism. How ponderously it attempted to canonise with its polysyllabic sonority that inverted boy scoutishness of the said youths and maidens, one bad, mad deed, sonnet, scribble of some kind, lousy daub a day. Bunk without spunk, source without force, futurism without a past, merely a transition from one yelping pose to another. And then I suddenly found myself at the end of the garden attempting desperately to hide myself behind a rowan tree while my eyes were held relentlessly to face the door. And then it began slowly to open, and something which was horridly unlike anything I had seen before began passing through it, and I knew, it knew, I was there. And then my head seemed to burst and flamed asunder, splintered and destroyed, 
and I awoke, trembling, to feel that something in the darkness was poised an inch or two above me, and then drip, 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 something began falling on my face. Mary was in the bed next to mine, and I would not scream, but flung the clothes over my head, my eyes streaming with the tears of terror, and so I remained cowering until I heard the clock strike five, and dawn, the ally I longed for, came, and the birds began to sing, and then I slept. I awoke a wreck, and after breakfast, feeling the need to be alone, I pretended I wanted to sketch and went out into the garden. Suddenly I recalled Sir William's remark about coming to see him if there was any trouble, not much difficulty in guessing what he had meant. I'd go and see him about it at once. I wished I knew whether Mary was troubled too. I hesitated to ask her, for if she were not, she was certain to become suspicious and uneasy if I questioned her. And then I discovered that while my brain had been busy with its thoughts, my hand had also not been idle, but had been occupied in drawing a very singular design on the sketching block. I watched it as it went automatically on. Was it a design or a figure of some sort? When had I seen something like it before? My God, in my dream last night. I tore it to pieces and got up in agitation and made my way to the manor house along a path through tall, bowing, stippled grasses hissing lightly in the breeze. My inclination was to run to the station and take the next train to anywhere, pure, undiluted panic, an insufficiently analysed word, that which causes men to trample on women and children when death is making his choice. Of course, I had Mary and Tim and the servants to keep me from it, but supposing they had no claim on me, should I desert them? No, I should not. Why? Such things are not done by respectable inhabitants of Great Britain, a people despised and respected by all other tribes, despised as Philistines, but it took the jawbone of an ass to subdue that hardy race. Respected for what? Birkenhead stuff. No, not the noble lord, for there were no glittering prizes for those who went down to the bottom of the sea in ships. My mind deliberately restricting itself to such highly debatable jingoism, I reached the manor house, to be told that Sir William was up in London for the day, but would return that evening. Would he ring me up on his return? Yes, sir. And then, with lagging steps, back to the Red Lodge. I took Mary for a drive in the car after lunch. Anything to get out of the beastly place. Tim didn't come as he preferred to play in the garden. In the light of what happened, I suppose I shall be criticised for leaving Tim alone with the nurse. But at that time, I held the theory that these appearances were in no way malignant and that it was more than possible that even if Tim did see anything, he wouldn't be frightened, not realising it was out of the ordinary in any way. After all, nothing that I had seen or heard, at any rate during the daytime, would strike him as unusual. Mary was very silent, and I was beginning to feel sure, from a certain depression and oppression in her manner and appearance, that my trouble was hers. It was on the tip of my tongue to say something, but I resolved to wait until I had heard what Sir William had to say. It was a dark, sombre and brooding afternoon, and my spirits fell as we returned for home. What a home! We got back at six, and I had just stopped the engine and helped Mary out when I heard a scream from the garden. I rushed round to see Tim, his hands to his eyes, staggering across the lawn, the nurse running behind him, and then he screamed again and fell. I carried him into the house and laid him down on the sofa in the drawing-room, and Mary went with him. I took the nurse by the arm and out of the room. She was panting and crying down a face of chalk. "'What happened? What happened?' I asked. "'I don't know what it was, sir, but we had been walking in the lane and had left the door open. Master Tim was a bit ahead of me and went through the door first, and then he screamed, like that. Did you see anything that could have frightened him?' "'No, sir. Nothing.' I went back to them. It was no good questioning Tim, and there was nothing coherent to be learned from his hysterical sobbing. He grew calmer presently and was taken up to bed. 
Suddenly he turned to Mary and looked at her with eyes of terror. The green monkey won't get me, will it, mummy? No, no, it's all right now, said Mary. And soon after he went to sleep, and then she and I went down to the drawing room. She was on the border of hysteria herself. Oh, Tom, what is the matter with this awful house? I'm terrified. Ever since I've been here, I've been terrified. Do you see things? Yes, I replied. Oh, I wish I'd known. I, I didn't want to worry you if you hadn't. Let me tell you what it's been like. On the day we arrived, I saw a man pass ahead of me into my bedroom. Of course, I only thought I had. And then... I've heard beastly whisperings, and every time I pass that turn in the corridor, I know there's someone just round the corner. And then, the day before you arrived, I woke suddenly and something seemed to force me to go to the window, and I crawled there on hands and knees and peeped through the blind. It was just light enough to see. And suddenly I saw someone running down the lawn, his or her hands outstretched, and there was something ghastly just beside him and they disappeared behind the trees at the end. I'm terrified every minute. What about the servants? Nurse hasn't seen anything. But the others have, I'm certain. And then there are those slimy patches. I think they're the vilest of all. I don't think Tim has been troubled till now, but I'm sure he's been puzzled and uncertain several times. Well, I said, it's pretty obvious we must clear out. I'm seeing Sir William about it tomorrow, I hope, and I'm certain enough of what he'll advise. Meanwhile, we must think over where to go. It's a nasty jar, though. I don't mean merely the money, though that's bad enough, but the fuss. Just when I hoped we were going to be so happy and settled. However, it's got to be done. We should be mad after a week of this filth-drenched hole. Just then the telephone bell rang. It was a message to say Sir William would be pleased to see me at half-past ten tomorrow. With the dusk came that sense of being watched, waited for, followed about, plotted against, an atmosphere of quiet, hunting malignancy. A thick mist came up from the river, and as I was changing for dinner, I noticed the lights from the windows seemed to project a series of swiftly changing pictures on its grey crawling screen. The one opposite my window, for example, was unpleasantly suggestive of three figures staring in and seeming to grow nearer and larger. The effect must have been slightly hypnotic, for suddenly I started back, for it was as if they were about to close on me. I pulled down the blind and hurried downstairs. During dinner, we decided that unless Sir William had something very reassuring to say, we would go back to London two days later and stay at a hotel till we could find somewhere to spend the next six weeks. Just before going to bed, we went up to the night nursery to see if Tim was all right. This room was at the top of a short flight of stairs. As these stairs were covered in green slime, and there was a pool of the muck just outside the door, we took him down to sleep with us. The permanent occupants of the Red Lodge waited till the light was out. But then I felt them come thronging, slipping in one by one, their weapon, fear. It seemed to me they were masked for the attack. A yard away, my wife was lying with my son in her arms, so I must fight. I lay back, gripped the sides of the bed, and strove with all my might to hold my assailants back. As the hours went by, I felt myself beginning to get the upper hand, and a sense of exultation came to me. But an hour before dawn they made their greatest effort. I knew that they were willing me to creep on my hands and knees to the window and peep through the blind, and that if I did so, we were doomed. As I set my teeth and tightened my grip till I felt racked with agony, the sweat poured from me. I felt them come crowding round the bed and thrusting their faces into mine, and a voice in my head kept saying insistently, You must crawl to the window and look through the blinds. In my mind's eye, I could see myself crawling stealthily across the floor, 
and pulling the blind aside. But who would be staring back at me? Just when I felt my resistance breaking, I heard a sweet, sleepy twitter from a tree outside and saw the blind touched by a faint suggestion of light, and at once those with whom I had been struggling left me and went their way, and, utterly exhausted, I slept. In the morning I found, somewhat ironically, that Mary had slept better than on any night since she came down. Half past ten found me entering the manor house, a delightful nondescript old place which started wagging its tail as soon as I entered it. Sir William was awaiting me in the library. I expected this would happen, he said gravely, and now tell me. I gave him a short outline of our experiences. Yes, he said, it's always much the same story. Every time that horrible place has been let, I have felt a sense of personal responsibility, and yet I cannot give a proper warning, for the letting of haunted houses is not yet a criminal offence, though it ought to be and I couldn't afford a libel action, and, as a matter of fact, one old couple had the house for fifteen years and were perfectly delighted with it, being troubled in no way. But now, let me tell you what I know of the Red Lodge. I have studied it for forty years, and I regard it as my personal enemy. The local tradition is that the second owner, early in the eighteenth century, wished to get rid of his wife, and bribed his servants to frighten her to death. Just the sort of ancestor I can imagine that blackguard Wilkes being descended from. What devilries they perpetrated, I don't know, but she is supposed to have rushed from the house just before dawn one day and drowned herself, whereupon her husband installed a small harem in the house. But it was a failure, for each of these charmers one by one rushed down to the river just before dawn, and finally the husband did the same. Of the period between then and forty years ago I have no record, but the local tradition has it that it was the scene of tragedy after tragedy, and then was shut up for a long time. When I first began to study it, it was occupied by two bachelor brothers. One shot himself in the room which I imagine you use as your bedroom, and the other drowned himself in the usual way. I may tell you that the worst room in the house the one the unfortunate lady is supposed to have occupied, is locked up, you know, the one on the second floor. I imagine Wilkes mentioned it to you. Yes, he did, I replied, said he kept important papers there. Yes, well, he was forced in self-defence to do so ten years ago, and since then the death rate has been lower, but in those forty years twenty people have taken their lives in the house or in the river, and six children have been drowned accidentally. The last case was Lord Passover's butler in 1924. He was seen to run down to the river and leap in. He was pulled out, but had died of shock. The people who took the house two years ago left in a week and threatened to bring an action against Wilkes, but they were warned they had no legal case. And I strongly advise you, more than that, implore you to follow their example, though I can imagine the financial loss and great inconvenience, for that house is a death trap. I will, I replied. I, I forgot to mention one thing. When my little boy was so badly frightened, he, he said something about a, a green monkey. He did, said Sir William sharply. Well then, it is absolutely imperative that you should leave at once. You remember I mentioned the death of certain children. Well, in each case they have been found drowned in the reeds just at the end of that lane, and the people about here have a firm belief that the green thing, or the green death, it is sometimes referred to as the first and sometimes as the other, is connected with danger to children. Have you ever seen anything yourself? I asked. I go to the infernal place as little as possible, replied Sir William, but when I called on your predecessors, I most distinctly saw someone leave the drawing room as we entered it. Otherwise, all I have noted is a certain dream which recurs with curious regularity. I find myself standing at the end of the lane and watching the river, always in a sort of brassy half-light, and presently something comes floating down the stream. I can see it jerking up and down, and I always feel passionately anxious to see what it may be. At first I think it is a log, but when it gets exactly opposite me, it changes its course and comes towards me 
And then I see that it is a dead body, very decomposed. And when it reaches the bank, it begins to climb up towards me. And then, I am thankful to say, I always awake. Sometimes I have thought that one day I shall not wake just then, and that on this occasion something will happen to me, but that is probably merely the silly fancy of an old gentleman who has concerned himself with these singular events rather more than is good for his nerves. That is obviously the explanation, I said, and I am extremely grateful to you. We will leave tomorrow. But don't you think we should attempt to devise some means by which other people may be spared this sort of thing, and this brute Wilkes be prevented from letting the house again? I certainly do so, and we will discuss it further on some other occasion. And now, go and pack. A very great and charming gentleman, Sir William, I reflected, as I walked back to the Red Lodge. Tim seemed to have recovered excellently well, but I thought it wise to keep him out of the house as much as possible, so while Mary and the maids packed after lunch, I went with him for a walk through the fields. We took our time, and it was only when the sky grew black and there was a distant rumble of thunder and a menacing little breeze came from the west that we turned to come back. We had to hurry, and as we reached the meadow next to the house, there came a ripping flash and the storm broke. We started to run for the door into the garden when I tripped over my bootlace, which had come undone, and fell. Tim ran on. I had just tied the lace and was on my feet again when I saw something slip through the door. It was green, thin, tall. It seemed to glance back at me, and what should have been its face was a patch of soused slime. At that moment Tim saw it, screamed and ran for the river. The figure turned and followed him, and before I could reach him, hovered over him. Tim screamed again and flung himself in. A moment later I passed through a green and stenching film and dived after him. I found him, writhing in the reeds, and brought him to the bank. I ran with him in my arms to the house, and I shall not forget Mary's face as she saw us from the bedroom window. By nine o'clock we were all in a hotel in London and the Red Lodge was an evil, fading memory. I shut the front door when I had packed them all into the car. As I took hold of the knob, I felt a quick and powerful pressure from the other side, and it shut with a crash. The permanent occupants of the Red Lodge were in sole possession once more. The Topley Place Sale by A. N. L. Munby. I wish you'd tell me all about the Topley Place sale, I said. What do you mean, all about it? asked my companion. Well, I replied, I heard that something rather odd occurred in connection with it, which wasn't given any publicity at the time. Ian Maxwell, a member of a well-known firm of art auctioneers, looked at me quizzically across the luncheon table. I think I'm being pumped, he said. I've no idea how much you do know, but if there are stories going round about it, you'd better hear the truth. About six months ago, a man named Dunton came to see me. I knew him by name. He was a stockbroker, and I'd once had some dealings with his firm. He told me that he'd just inherited Topley Place, being apparently the nephew of old Sir Robert Topley, who just died. I knew that Dunton was a rich man, and my first thought was how fortunate it was that the place had got an owner who could afford to spend some money on it. It's a glorious house, but it wants a little doing to it. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was described in Country Life about ten years ago, an entirely unspoilt Jacobean house. I congratulated Dunton on his good fortune, but he seemed very lukewarm about it. He said it was a white elephant, inaccessible and inconvenient, that he would never consider living there, and would let it, if he could find a tenant. Then he went on to say, I believe there's some very good furniture down there, and pictures too. I want you to send a man down with me when I go there tomorrow for the first time. I never knew the old man very well. In fact, I only inherit by virtue of being the nearest relation. I said that I would be glad to accompany him myself, and asked him if he knew of any pictures of particular interest. 
His reply will give you a pretty good idea of the sort of man he was. I haven't the faintest idea, he said, but I can tell you this. If there's anything saleable, it's coming straight up to Tyne. You won't find me keeping thousands of pounds worth of capital locked up on the walls. I have no sympathy with that sort of sentiment. A fellow came to see me the other day about raising some money, said he was hard up, and I know for a fact that he has a couple of Gainsboroughs in his dining room. If you'll come down to Topley with me tomorrow and pick out anything good, I want it sold this season. It's no use waiting. Prices, I understand, are pretty good, and that money might be earning five per cent. Well, as you know, selling works of art is my bread and butter, so I ought to have been pleased that there was something almost disgusting in the man's eagerness to scatter his dead uncle's possessions to the four wind. It wasn't as if he needed the money. However, I naturally agreed, and we arranged to meet at Paddington at ten o'clock on the following day. We had an uneventful journey down to Somerset, and arrived at the house about lunchtime, it was a really charming place and had obviously been well cared for, but one could see that there hadn't been quite enough money to make it into a show place. As it was Dunton's first visit, the agent had got all the servants lined up to greet their new master. It was all rather old-fashioned, but personally I liked that sort of thing. It was then that I first realised what a complete outsider Dunton was. The occasion obviously demanded a little speech, but he made not the slightest attempt to be civil, and even had the consummate bad taste to start a discussion on the question of staff reduction in their presence. The agent sent them off, and started to show us round the house. He was a very decent fellow called Elliot, a man of about fifty, who had been there for nearly thirty years. Of course, as soon as he had realised that Dunton had brought me down to strip the place of its pictures and furniture, he regarded me with considerable hostility, and I can't altogether blame him. Dunton treated him like dirt, and I was there as Dunton's professional adviser. I don't think I've ever had quite such an embarrassing day, and I'm pretty hardened to going round houses. Well, there were some very nice things, and I made a list as we went. A big panel of Gobelin tapestry, some very fair armour, a good refectory table, two really fine William and Mary inlaid cabinets, and a lot of other very saleable furniture. The pictures too were promising. Nothing sensational, mostly good English school. A Richard Wilson, two Zoffanies, as well as a delightful Guardi. In the study there were some modern pictures, none of much account, except for one magnificent early John portrait, which I realised was of Dunton painted probably thirty years before. He told me that his uncle had commissioned it in 1910. I was interested to compare my companion's face with the picture, to see how much his material success had filled out the features, giving him an air of complacency that was lacking in the painting. But even in his early twenties his mouth had assumed its present hard line. Of course, it didn't occur to me that he would want to sell his own portrait. But he asked me what I thought it would fetch. I gave a rough estimate of three or four hundred pounds, and he recalled with considerable glee that his uncle had only paid the artist a hundred guineas in 1910. The best investment he ever made, he said. Send it up with the rest of the stuff. So I added it to my list and we passed on. I was desperately sorry for the agent. He had grown up with the place and was obviously very proud of it. And I could imagine that on hearing of the wealth of the new owner, he had been planning all sorts of improvements. But instead of improvements, Dunton seemed intent on denuding the house of all its treasures. However, Elliot didn't say much, but accompanied us from room to room. In the small drawing room, we stopped in front of a picture of a naval officer on the wall. Below, on a table, were laid out what had obviously been his belongings a great silver-mounted telescope, a gilt dress sword with a presentation inscription upon it, and a pair of finely engraved pistols. In a case nearby was a suit of naval uniform. Elliot pointed to them and said emphatically, Well, anyhow, you can't sell these. They're heirlooms and entailed. Dunton rounded on him angrily. Don't try to teach me my business, he snapped. Do you think I don't know the conditions of my inheritance? I'm not a tenant for life as my uncle was. 
I am the absolute owner of this property, and as such I can sell what I choose. And if I ever require your advice on the subject, I'll ask for it. I hastened to interpose. I don't really think that they'd fetch very much in the open market, I said. They are the sort of things that are of the greatest family interest, but they're not really early enough to attract the collector. I doubt if they'd sell for more than a few pounds. Dunton ignored my remarks, and looking coldly at the agent, he said, Put them down on the list. Of course, the man was a sadist. He was just out to show Elliot who was master. If the agent hadn't suggested that they couldn't be sold, Dunton would have taken my advice. As it was, I had no choice but to note them down. They were perfectly readily saleable, but it seemed so unnecessary to take them from where they belonged for the sake of the few pounds that they'd bring in the auction room. The agent turned quite pale with anger. I thought he was going to tell Dunton exactly what he thought of him. However, he controlled himself and merely said, You may be right about the legal side of the question. I dare say there's no actual ban on your selling, but if you'll take my advice, you won't do it. Admiral Topley was a quick-tempered man, and I shouldn't like to ignore his instructions, even if he has been dead a hundred years. It was his expressed wish that these relics should be preserved in his house, and I should have thought that you might have respected his request. However, you won't be influenced by my views on the subject, but don't say that I didn't warn you. On saying this, he turned abruptly and left us. Dunton seemed more amused than annoyed. The incident typified for him the sentiment that he found so ridiculously unworldly. I looked with interest at the portrait. Though obviously not the work of a first-class artist, one could not fail to be struck by the figure depicted. It was full length and showed an officer in the naval uniform of the time of Nelson, and like Nelson, lacked an arm. The empty left sleeve was neatly pinned across the breast. The face was of a proud, imperious man, used to giving orders and to being obeyed with alacrity. The nose was aquiline, and the cheekbones rather high. I have seldom seen a more obviously patrician face. The artist had caught well the weather-beaten mahogany complexion born of long exposure. I agreed with Elliot that he had probably been quick-tempered. He looked as though he would be intolerant of any interference with his wishes and would bitterly resent any affront. We passed on, and I found a few more things to send up to the sale. When I went back to town that night, I had every reason to be pleased with myself, but I couldn't get the memory of Dunton's boorishness and Elliot's distress out of my mind. However, it obviously wasn't politic to quarrel with my client. And if we didn't undertake the sale... I was quite sure that he would merely find another auctioneer, and the Topley Place sale was obviously going to be one of the highlights of a fairly commonplace season. In due course, the stuff was sent up to our rooms, and we set to work on preparing the catalogue. Our picture man was very pleased with his share of the sale, and made a big thing of the Guardi. I decided to catalogue the portrait and relics of Admiral Topley myself, I had an irrational desire to do the old man proud and to write him up well in the catalogue. I searched about for information on him and his career. I didn't find much, though. He had never been a great figure in the Navy, becoming a rear admiral only a year before his retirement in 1807. In 1790, I discovered he had fought a duel and his opponent had died of his wounds. But the affair didn't seem to have affected his career, because he was a captain commanding a ship of the line at Camperdown under Duncan, where he lost his arm. The silver gilt sword was given to him by the city of Wells, where he lived at that time. He inherited Topley Place in 1804, but didn't settle there until six years later. He lived there until his death in 1831 at the age of 83. I got my leg pulled a good deal for spending so much more time on the old man than could be justified by the price he would fetch. But I didn't care. The catalogue was printed and sent out. Expect you got a copy. A week before the sale, the property was put on view in the large gallery. I had the Admiral hung in an alcove with a table in front of him, on which were spread out his pistol, sword, telescope and uniform. I felt quite ashamed when I saw him there with a lot number in the corner of his frame, looking, I thought, more imperious than ever. I'd done my best to interest a few possible purchasers in him, 
writing to the Maritime Museum at Greenwich and to Wells about his sword, but I couldn't see the whole lot fetching more than about twenty-five pounds. The portrait of Dunton by John, on the other hand, aroused a lot of interest, both in the trade and among private collectors, and I don't mind telling you that we had several substantial bids left with us for it. Up to now, I expect you found this story pretty straightforward, but just before the sale, something very odd indeed occurred. If I hadn't been so intimately concerned in it, and if I couldn't vouch for every detail myself, I should have considerable difficulty in believing it. As I expect you know, we employ a night watchman. We often have £50,000 worth of stuff in the galleries, and we can't afford to take any risks. Our watchman is a most reliable man who's been with us for years, an ex-sergeant from the Brigade of Guards. On the morning of the sale, I found him waiting for me in my office, looking extremely worried. He told me that he'd been downstairs at about midnight when he thought he heard a report somewhere in the building. He had a good look around, but couldn't find anything, and eventually assumed, very naturally, that he had heard a car backfiring outside. But when daylight came, he discovered that the John portrait of Dunton had been defaced. Of course, when I heard this, I went quickly up to the gallery to have a look at it. I don't really expect that you'll believe me when I tell you what I found. There was a round hole in the head, and this was blackened round the edges as though it had been made with some firearm at point-blank range. The wall behind was not marked in any way, and, believe it or not, one of the Admiral's pistols had been fired. There was no mistake about that. They had been bright and clean, but now the barrel of one of them was fouled. My first thought was to ring up Dunton. The picture was insured, of course, but we should have to withdraw it from the sale. When I got through to his house, I received my second shock of the morning, for Dunton had died of heart failure during the night. Apparently it wasn't altogether unexpected. His heart had been giving him trouble for years. Of course, this may have been purely fortuitous. Some madman may have broken into our premises, defaced the portrait. Dunton's death on the same night may have been mere coincidence. But I know, and you know, that that isn't the true explanation. It was one of those things which are at present outside the range of human experience. Naturally, the sale had to be postponed, as we had to get the new owner's instructions before proceeding. Dunton was unmarried, and his heir was a married sister of his. She and her husband were overjoyed at the possibility of living at Topley, and they wouldn't hear of the sale going on. Everything was returned to the house. I went down there again the other day. The Admiral was back in his rightful place, and though I felt that he'd lost us the best sale of the season, I was delighted to see him there. And I don't think that any future owner of Topley Place will be in a hurry to send him up to the sale room again. Peckweather, the historian, whose turn for storytelling came at our last dinner before the summer interregnum, apologised for reading his narrative. He was not good, he said, at impromptu composition. He also congratulated himself on Lethan's absence. He comes into the story, and I should feel rather embarrassed talking about him to his face. But he has read my manuscript and approved it, so you have two reliable witnesses to a queerish tale. In his precise academic voice, he read what follows. The October night was brightening towards late afternoon when Lethen and I climbed the hill above the stream and came in sight of the house. All morning a haze with a sheen of pearl in it had lain on the folds of downland, and the vision of far horizons, which is the glory of Cotswold, had been veiled, so that every valley seemed a place enclosed and set apart. But now a glow had come into the air, and for a little... The autumn lawns had the tints of summer. The gold of sunshine was warm on the grasses, and only the riot of colour in the berry-laden edges of the fields and the slender woodlands told of the failing year. We were looking into a green cup of the hills, and it was all a garden, a little place bounded by slopes that defined its graciousness with no hint of barrier, so that a dweller there, though his view was but a half a mile on any side, would yet have the sense of dwelling on uplands and commanding the world. Round the top edge, 
ran an old wall of stones beyond which the October bracken flamed to the skyline. Inside were folds of ancient pasture with here and there a thorn bush fall into rose gardens, and on one side to the smooth sward of a terrace above a tiny lake. At the heart of it stood the house, like a jewel well set. It was a miniature, but by the hand of a master. The style was late 17th century, when an agreeable classic convention had opened up to sunlight and comfort the dark magnificence of the Tudor fashion. The place had the spacious air of a great mansion, and was finished in every detail with a fine scrupulousness. Only when the eye measured its proportions with woods and the hillside did the mind perceive that it was a small dwelling. The stone of Cotswold takes curiously the colour of the weather. Under thunderclouds it will be as dark as basalt. On a grey day it is grey like lava, but in the sunshine it absorbs the sun. At the moment the little house was pale gold, like honey. Lethan swung a long leg across the stile. Pretty good, isn't it, he said. It's pure authentic Sir Christopher Wren. The name's worthy of it, too. It's called Full Circle. He told me its story. It had been built after the restoration by the Carteran family, whose wide domains ran into these hills. The Lord Carteran of the day was a friend of the Merry Monarch, but it was not as a sanctuary for orgies that he built the house. Perhaps he was tired of the gloomy splendour of Minster Carteran and wanted a home of his own and not of his ancestors' choosing. He had an elegant taste in letters, as we can learn from his neat imitations of Marshall, his pretty bucolics, and the more than respectable Latin hexameters of his Ars Vivendi. Being a great nobleman, he had the best skill of the day to construct his hermitage, and here he would retire for months at a time with like-minded friends to a world of books and gardens. He seems to have had no ill wishes. Contemporary memoirs speak of him charitably, and Dryden spared him four lines of encomium. A selfish old dog, Lethan called him. He had the good sense to eschew politics and enjoy life. His soul is in that little house. He only did one rash thing in his career. He anticipated the king, his master, by some years and turning papist. I asked about its later history. After his death it passed to a younger branch of the Carterans. It left them in the 18th century and the Applebys got it. They were a jovial lot of hunting squires and let the library go to the dogs. Old Colonel Appleby was still alive when I came to Borroughby. Something went wrong in his inside when he was nearly seventy, and the doctors knocked him off liquor. Not that he drank too much, though he did himself well. That finished the poor old boy. He told me that it revealed to him the amazing truth, that during a long and, as he hoped, publicly useful life, he had never been quite sober. He was a good fellow, and I missed him when he died. The place went to a remote cousin called Giffen. Lethan's eyes, as they scanned the prospect, seemed amused. Julian and Ursula Giffen, I dare say you'll know the names. They always hunt in couples and write books about sociology and advanced ethics and psychics, books called either The New This or That or Towards Something or Other. You know the sort of thing. They're deep in all the pseudosciences. Decent souls, but you can guess the type. I came across them in a case I had at the Old Bailey defending a ruffian who was charged with murder. I hadn't a doubt that he deserved hanging on twenty counts, but there wasn't enough evidence to convict him on this one. Dodderidge was at his worst. It was just before they induced him to retire, and his handling of the jury was a masterpiece of misdirection. Of course there was a shindy. The thing was a scandal, and it stirred up all the humanitarians till the murder was almost forgotten in the iniquities of old Dodderidge. You must remember the case. It filled the papers for weeks. Well, it was in that connection that I fell in with the Giffins. I got rather to like them, and I've been to see them at their house in Hampstead. Golly, what a place. And colours that made you want to weep. I never met people with heads so full of feathers. I said something about that being an odd milieu for him. Oh, I like human beings, all kinds. It's my profession to study them, for without that the practice of law would be a lean affair. There are hordes of people like the Giffins, only not so good, for they really do have hearts of gold. They are the rootless stuff in the world today, in revolt against everything and everybody with any ancestry, a kind of innocent self-righteousness, wanting to be the people with whom wisdom begins and ends. They are mostly sensitive and tender-hearted, but they wear themselves out in an eternal dissidence. Can't build, you know, for they object to all tools, but very ready to crab. 
They scorn any form of Christianity, but they'll walk miles to patronise some wretched sect that has the merit of being brand new. Pioneers, they call themselves. Funny little unclad people adventuring into the cold desert with no maps. Giffen once described himself and his friends to me as forward-looking, but that, of course, is just what they are not. To tackle the future, you must have a firm grip of the past, and for them, the past is only a pathological curiosity. They're up to their necks in the mud of the present, but good after a fashion, and innocent, sordidly innocent. Fate was in an ironical mood when it saddled them with that wicked little house. Wicked it did not seem to me to be a fair word. It sat honey-coloured among its gardens with the meekness of a dove. The sound of a bicycle on the road behind us made us turn round, and Lethen advanced to meet a dismounting rider. He was a tallish fellow, some forty years old perhaps, with one of those fluffy blonde beards that have never been shaved. Short-sighted, of course, and wore glasses. Biscuit-coloured knickerbockers and stockings clad his lean limbs. Lethen introduced me. We're walking to Borrowby and stopped to admire your house. Could we just have a glimpse inside? I want Peckweather to see the staircase. Mr Giffen was very willing. I've been over to Clyston to send a telegram. We have some friends for the weekend who might interest you. Won't you stay for tea? There was a gentle formal courtesy about him, and his voice had the facile intonations of one who loves to talk. He led us through a little gate and along a shorn green walk among the bracken to a postern which gave entrance to the garden. Here, though it was October, there was still a bright show of roses, and the jet of water from the leaden cupid dripped noiselessly among fallen petals. And then we stood before the doorway, above which the old Carterton had inscribed a line of Horace. I have never seen anything quite like that little hall. There were two, indeed, separated by a staircase of wood that looked like olive. Both were paved with black and white marble and the inner was oval in shape, with a gallery supported on slender walnut pillars. It was all in miniature, but it had a spaciousness which no mere size could give. Also, it seemed to be permeated by the quintessence of sunlight. Its air was of long-descended, confident, equable happiness. There were voices on the terrace beyond the hall. Giffen led us into a room on the left. You remember the house in Colonel Appleby's time, Lethen? This was the chapel. It had always been the chapel. You see the change we've made. I beg your pardon, Mr. Peckweather. You're not by any chance a Roman Catholic. The room had a white panelling and on two sides deep windows. At one end was a fine Italian shrine of marble, and the floor was mosaic, blue and white, in a quaint Byzantine pattern. There was the same air of sunny cheerfulness as in the rest of the house. No mystery could find a lodgment here. It might have been a chapel for three centuries, but the place was pagan. The Giffen's changes were no sort of desecration. A green baize table filled most of the floor, surrounded by chairs like a committee room. On new raw wood shelves were files of papers and stacks of blue books, and those desiccated works into which reformers of society torture the English tongue. Two typewriters stood on a side table. It's our workroom, Giffen explained, where we hold our Sunday moots. Ursula thinks that a weekend is wasted unless it produces some piece of real work. Often a quite valuable committee has its beginning here. We try to make our home a refuge for busy workers, where they need not idle, but can work under happy conditions. A college situate in a clearer air, Lethen quoted, but Giffen did not respond except with a smile. He'd probably never heard of Lord Falkland. A woman entered the room, a woman who might have been pretty if she had taken a little pains. Her reddish hair was drawn tightly back and dressed in a hard knot, and her clothes were horribly incongruous in a remote manor house. She had bright, eager eyes like a bird, and hands that fluttered nervously. She greeted Lethen with warmth. We've settled down marvellously, she told him. Julian and I feel as if we'd always lived here, and our life has arranged itself so perfectly. My mother's cottages in the village will soon be ready and the club is to be opened next week. Julian and I will carry on the classes ourselves for the first winter. Next year, we hope to have a really fine programme and then it's so pleasant to be able to entertain one's friends. Won't you stay to tea? Dr Swope is here and Mary Elliston and Mr Perky Blake, you know, the Member of Parliament. Must you hurry off? I'm so sorry. What do you think of our workroom? It was utterly terrible when we first came here. 
a sort of decayed chapel like a withered tuberose. We have let the air of heaven into it. I observed that I had never seen a house so full of space and light. Are oh, you noticed that? It's a curiously happy place to live in. Sometimes I'm almost afraid to feel so light-hearted. But we look on ourselves as only trustees. It's a trust we have to administer for the common good. You know, it's a house on which you can lay down your own impress. I can imagine places which dominate the dwellers, but full circle is plastic, and we can make it our own just as much as if we had planned it and built it. That's our chief piece of good fortune. We took our leave, for we had no desire for the company of Dr. Swope and Mr. Percy Blaker. When we reached the highway, we halted and looked back on the little jewel. Shafts of the westering sun now caught the stone and turned the honey to ripe gold. Thin spires of amethyst smoke rose into the still air. I thought of the well-meaning restless couple inside its walls, and somehow they seemed out of the picture. They simply didn't matter. The house was a thing, for I had never met in inanimate stone such an air of gentle masterfulness. It had a personality of its own, clean-cut and secure, like a high-born old dame among the females of profiteers, and Mrs. Giffen claimed to have given it her impress. That night in the library at Borrowby, Lethen discoursed of the restoration, Borrowby of which by the expenditure of much care and a good deal of money he has made a civilised dwelling, is a Tudor manor of the Cotswold type, with high-pitched narrow roofs and tall stone chimneys, rising sheer from the meadows, with something of the massiveness of a border keep. He nodded towards the linen fold panelling and the great carven chimney piece. In this kind of house you have the mystery of the elder England. What was Raleigh's phrase? High thoughts and divine contemplations. The people who built this sort of thing lived close to another world, and they thought bravely of death. It doesn't matter who they were, crusaders or Elizabethans or Puritans. They all had poetry in them, and the heroic and a great unworldliness. They had marvellous spirits and plenty of joys and triumphs, but they also had their hours of black gloom. Their lives were like our weather, storm and sun. One thing they never feared, death. He walked too near them all their days to be a bogey. But the restoration was a sharp break. It brought paganism into England, paganism and the art of life. No people have ever known better the secret of a bland happiness. Look at full circle. There are no dark corners there. The man that built it knew all there was to be known about how to live. The trouble was that they didn't know how to die. That was the one shadow on the glass, so they provided for it in the pagan way. They tried magic. They never became true Catholics. They were always pagan to the end, but they smuggled a priest into their lives. He was a kind of insurance premium against unwelcome mystery. It was not until nearly two years later that I saw the Giffins again. The Mayfly season was near its close, and I had snatched a day on a certain limpid Cotswold River. There was another man on the same beat fishing from the opposite bank, and I watched him with some anxiety, for a duffer would have spoilt my day. To my relief, I recognised Giffin. With him it was easy to come to terms, and presently the water was parcelled out between us. We foregathered for luncheon and I stood watching while he neatly stalked rose and landed a trout. I confessed to some surprise, first that Giffen should be a fisherman at all, for it was not in keeping with my old notion of him, and second, that he should cast such a workmanlike line. As we lunched together, I observed several changes. He had shaved his fluffy beard, and his face was notably less lean, and had the clear, even sunburn of the countryman. His clothes, too, were different. They also were workmanlike, and looked as if they belonged to him. No more the uneasy knickerbockers of the Sunday golfer. I'm desperately keen, he told me. You see, it's only my second Mayfly season, and last year I was no better than a beginner. I wish I'd known long ago what good fun fishing was. Isn't this a blessed place? And he looked up through the canopy of flowering chestnuts to the June sky. I'm glad you've taken to sport, I said, even if you only come here for the weekends. Sport lets you into the secrets of the countryside. Oh, we don't go much to London now, was his answer. We sold our Hampstead house a year ago. I can't think how I ever could stick that place. Ursula takes the same view. I wouldn't leave Oxfordshire just now for a thousand pounds. Do you smell the hawthorn? Last week this meadow was scented like paradise. Do you know, Lethan's a queer fellow. I asked why. 
He once told me that this countryside in June made him sad. He said it was too perfect a thing for fallen humanity. I call that morbid. Do you see any sense in it? I knew what Lethan meant, but it would have taken too long to explain. I feel warm and good and happy, he went on. I used to talk about living close to nature. Rot. I didn't know what nature meant. Now, he broke off, by Jove, there's a kingfisher. That is only the second I've seen this year. They're getting uncommon with us. With us, I like that phrase. He was becoming a true countryman. We had a good day. Not extravagantly successful, but satisfactory. And he persuaded me to come home with him to full circle for the night, explaining that I could catch an early train next morning at the junction. So we extricated a little two-seater from a thicket of lilacs, and he drove me through four miles of sweet-scented dusk, with nightingales shouting in every thicket. I changed into a suit of his flannels in the bedroom, looking out on the little lake where trout were rising, and I remember that I whistled from pure light-heartedness. In that adorable house, one seemed to be still breathing the air of the spring meadows. Dinner was my first big surprise. It was admirable, plain but perfectly cooked, and with that excellence of basic material, which is the glory of a well-appointed country house. There was wine too, which I am certain was a new thing. Giffen gave me a bottle of a sound claret, and afterwards some more than decent port. My second surprise was my hostess. Her clothes, like her husband's, must have changed, for I didn't notice what she was wearing, and I had noticed it only too clearly the last time we met. More remarkable was the difference in her face. For the first time I realised that she was a pretty woman. The contours had softened and rounded, and there was a charming well-being in her eyes, very different from the old restlessness. She looked content, infinitely content. I asked her about her mother's cottages. She laughed cheerfully. I gave them up after the first year. They didn't mix well with the village people. I'm quite ready to admit my mistake, and it was the wrong kind of charity. The Londoners didn't like it, felt loathsome and sighed for the fried fish shop, and the village women were shy of them, afraid of infectious complaints, you know. Julian and I have decided that our business is to look after our own people. It may have been malicious, but I said something about the wonderful scheme of village education. Another relic of Cockneyism laughed the lady, but Giffen looked a trifle shy. I gave it up because it didn't seem worthwhile. What's the use of spoiling a perfectly wholesome scheme of life by introducing unnecessary complications? Medicine's no good unless a man's sick, and these people aren't sick. Education is the only cure for certain diseases the modern world has engendered. But if you don't find the disease, the remedy is superfluous. The fact is, I hadn't the face to go on with the thing. I wanted to be taught rather than to teach. There's a whole world around me of which I know very little, and my first business is to get to understand it. Any village poacher can teach me more of the things that matter than what I have to tell him. Besides, we have so much to do, his wife added. There's the house and the garden and the home farm and the property. It isn't large, but it takes a lot of looking after. The dining room was long and low-ceilinged and had a white panelling in bold relief. Through the windows came odours of the garden and a faint tinkle of water. The dusk was deepening and the engravings in their rosewood frames were dim, but sufficient light remained to reveal the picture above the fireplace. It showed a middle-aged man in the clothes of the later Carolines, the plump tapering fingers of one hand held a book, the other was hidden in the folds of a flowered waistcoat. The long, curled wig framed a delicate face with something of the grace of youth left to it. There were quizzical lines about the mouth, and the eyes smiled pleasantly, yet very wisely. It was the face of a man I should have liked to dine with. He must have been the best of company. Giffen answered my question. That's the Lord Carterton who built the house. No, no relation. Our people were the Applebys who came in 1753. We've both fallen so deep in love with Full Circle that we wanted to see the man who conceived it. I had some trouble getting it. It came out of the Minster Carter and Sale, and I had to give a dealer twice what he paid for it. It's a jolly thing to live with. It was indeed a curiously charming picture. I found my eyes straying to it till the dusk obscured the features. It was the face of one wholly at home in a suave world, learned in all the urbanities. A good friend, I thought, the old lord must have been, and a superlative companion. 
I could imagine neat Horatian tags coming ripely from his lips. Not a strong face, but somehow a dominating one. The portrait of the long-dead gentleman had still the atmosphere of life. Giffen raised his glass of port to him as we rose from the table as if to salute a comrade. We moved to the room across the hall, which had once been the Giffen's workroom, the cradle of earnest committees and weighty memoranda. This was my third surprise. Bay's covered table and raw wood shelves had disappeared. The place was now half smoking room, half library. On the walls hung a fine collection of coloured sporting prints, and below them were ranged low heppelwhite bookcases. The lamplight glowed on the ivory walls, and the room, like everything else in the house, was radiant. Above the mantelpiece was a stag's head, a fair eleven-pointer. Giffen nodded proudly towards it. I got that last year at Macray, my first stag. There was a little table with an array of magazines and weekly papers. Some amusement must have been visible in my face as I caught sight of various light-hearted sporting journals, for he laughed apologetically. You mustn't think that Ursula and I take in that stuff for ourselves. It amuses our guests, you know. I dared say it did, but I was convinced that the guests were no longer Dr. Swope and Mr. Percy Blaker. One of my many failings is that I can never enter a room containing books without scanning the titles. Giffen's collection won my hearty approval. There were the very few novelists I can read myself, Miss Austen and Sir Walter and the admirable Marriott. There was a shelf full of memoirs and a good deal of 17th and 18th century poetry. There was a set of the classics in fine editions, Badonis and Baskervilles and such like. There was much county history and one or two valuable old herbals and itineraries. I was certain that two years before, Giffen would have had no use for literature except some muddy Russian oddments, and I am positive that he would not have known the name of Surtees. Yet there stood the tall Octavos recording the unedifying careers of Mr. Jorrocks, Mr. Facey Romford, and Mr. Soapy Sponge. I was a little bewildered as I stretched my legs in a very deep armchair. Suddenly, I had a strong impression of looking on at a play moving docilely at the orders of a masterful stage manager, and yet with no sense of bondage. And as I looked on, they faded off the scene, and there was only one personality, that house, so serene and secure, smiling at our modern antics, but weaving all the while an iron spell round its lovers. For a second, I felt an oppression, as of something to be resisted. But no, there was no oppression. The house was too well-bred and disdainful to seek to captivate. Only those who fell in love with it could know its mastery, for all love exacts a price. It was far more than a thing of stone and lime. It was a creed, an art, a scheme of life, older than any Carteran, older than England, somewhere far back in time, in Rome, in Attica, or in an Aegean island. There must have been such places. But then they called them temples, and gods dwelt in them. I was roused by Giffen's voice discoursing of his books. I've been rubbing up on my classics again, he was saying. Queer thing, but ever since I left Cambridge, I've been out of the mood for them, and I'm shockingly ill-read in English literature. I wish I had more time for reading, for it means a lot to me. There's such an embarrassment of riches here, said his wife. The days are far too short for all there is to do. Even when there's nobody staying in the house, I find every hour occupied. It's delicious to be busy over the things one really cares for. All the same, I wish I could do more reading, said Giffen. I've never wanted to so much before. But you come in tired from shooting and sleep sound till dinner, said the lady, laying an affectionate hand on his shoulders. They were very happy people, and I like happiness. Self-absorbed, perhaps, but I prefer selfishness in the ordinary way of things. We are most of us selfish dogs, and altruism makes us uncomfortable. But I had somewhere in my mind a shade of uneasiness, for I was the witness of a transformation too swift and violent to be wholly natural. Years, no doubt, turn our eyes inward and abate our heroics, but not a trifle of two or three. Some agency had been at work here, some agency other and more potent than the process of time. The thing fascinated and partly frightened me, for the Giffins, though I scarcely dared to admit it, had deteriorated. They were far pleasanter people. I liked them infinitely better. I hoped to see them often again. 
I detested the type they used to represent and shunned it like the plague. They were wise now and mellow and most agreeable human beings, but some virtue had gone out of them. An uncomfortable virtue, no doubt, but a virtue, something generous and adventurous. Before, their faces had had a sort of wistful kindness. Now, they had geniality, which is not the same thing. What was the agency of this miracle? It was all around me. The ivory panelling, the olive wood staircase, the lovely pillared hall. I got up to go to bed with a kind of awe on me. As Mrs. Giffen lit my candle, she saw my eyes wandering among the gracious shadows. Isn't it wonderful, she said, to have found a house which fits us like a glove. No, closer. Fits us as a bearskin fits the bear. It has taken our impress like wax. Somehow, I didn't think that the impress had come from the Giffen side. A November afternoon found Lethen and myself jogging homewards from a run with the Haythrop. It had been a wretched day. Twice we had found and lost, and then a deluge had set in which scattered the field. I had taken a hearty toss into a swamp and got as wet as a man may be, but the steady downpour soon reduced everyone to a like condition. When we turned towards Borrowby, the rain ceased, and an icy wind blew out of the east which partially dried our sopping clothes. All the grace had faded from the Cotswold valleys. The streams were brown torrents, the meadows lagoons, the ridges bleak and grey, and a sky of scurrying clouds cast leaden shadows. It was a matter of ten miles to Borrowby. We had long ago emptied our flasks, and I longed for something hot to take the chill out of my bones. Let's look in at full circle, said Lethen as we emerged on the high road from a muddy lane. We'll make the Giffins give us tea. You'll find changes there. I asked what changes, but he only smiled and told me to wait and see. My mind was busy with surmises as we rode up the avenue. I thought of drink or drugs and promptly discarded the notion. Full circle was above all things decorous and wholesome. Lethen couldn't mean the change in the Giffin's ways which had so impressed me a year before, for he and I had long discussed that. I was still puzzling over his words when we found ourselves in the inner hall, with the Giffins making a hospitable fuss over us. The place was more delectable than ever. Outside was a dark November day, yet the little house seemed to be transfused with sunshine. I don't know by what art the old builders had planned it, but the airy pilasters, the perfect lines of the ceiling, the soft colouring of the wood seemed to lay open the house to a clear sky. Logs burned brightly on the massive steel andirons, and the scent and the fine blue smoke of them strengthened the illusion of summer. Mrs. Giffen would have had us change into dry things, but Lethen pleaded a waiting dinner at Borrowby. The two of us stood by the fireplace drinking tea, the warmth drawing out a cloud of vapour from our clothes to mingle with the wood smoke. Giffen lounged in an armchair, and his wife sat by the tea table. I was looking for the changes of which Lethen had spoken. I didn't find them in Giffen. He was much the same as I remembered him on that June night when I had slept here, a trifle fuller in the face, perhaps, a little more placid about the mouth and eyes. He looked a man completely content with life. His smile came readily, and his easy laugh. Was it my fancy? Or had he acquired a look of the picture in the dining room? I nearly made an errand to go and see it. It seemed to me that his mouth had now something of the portrait's delicate complacence. Lely would have found him a fit subject, though he might have boggled at his lean hands. But his wife! Ah, there the changes were unmistakable. She was comely now rather than pretty, and the contours of her face had grown heavier. The eagerness had gone from her eyes and left only comfort and good humour. There was a... She had a string of good pearls, the first time I had seen her wear jewels. The hand that poured out the tea was plump, shapely and well cared for. I was looking at a most satisfactory mistress of a country house who would see that nothing was lacking to the part. She talked more and laughed oftener. Her voice had an airy lightness, which would have made the silliest prattle charming. We're going to fill the house with young people and give a ball at Christmas, she announced. This hall is simply clamouring to be danced in. You must come, both of you, promise me. And Mr. Lethen, it would be very kind if you brought a party from Borrowby. 
Young men, please. We're overstocked with girls in these parts. We must do something to make the country cheerful in winter time. I observed that no season could make full circle other than cheerful. How nice of you, she cried. To praise a house is to praise the householders, for a dwelling is just what its inmates make it. Borrowby is you, Mr. Lethan, and full circle is us. Shall we exchange, Lethan asked. She made a mouth. Borrowby would crush me, but it suits a gothic survival like you. Do you think you would be happy here? Happy, said Lethan thoughtfully. Happy? Yes, undoubtedly. But it might be bad for my soul. There's just time for a pipe, Giffen, and then we must be off. I was filling my pipe as we crossed the outer hall and was about to enter the smoking room I so well remembered when Giffen laid a hand on my arm. We don't smoke in there now, he said hastily. He opened the door and I looked in. The place had suffered its third metamorphosis. The marble shrine, which I had noticed on my first visit, had been brought back, and the blue mosaic pavement and the ivory walls were bare. At the eastern end stood a little altar, with above it a copy of a Correggio Madonna. A faint smell of incense hung in the air, and the fragrance of hothouse flowers. It was a chapel, but I swear a more pagan place than when it had been the workroom or smoking room. Giffen gently shut the door. Perhaps you didn't know, but some months ago my wife became a Catholic. It's a good thing for women, I think. It gives them a regular ritual for their lives. So we restored the chapel. It had always been there in the days of the Carterans and the Applebys. And you? I asked. He shrugged his shoulders. I don't bother much about these things, but I propose to follow suit. It'll please Ursula and do no harm to anybody. We halted on the brow of the hill and looked back on the garden valley. Lethan's laugh as he gazed had more awe than mirth in it. That wicked little house. I'm going to hunt up every scrap I can find about old Tom Carter and he must have been an uncommon clever fellow. He's still alive down there and making people do as he did. In that kind of place you may expel the priest and sweep it and garnish it. But he always returns. The rack was lifting before the wind and a shaft of late watery sun fell on the grey walls. It seemed to me that the little house wore an air of gentle triumph. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. come back. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?